This meeting is being recorded. Welcome, Commissioner Severson. Thank you. Appreciate you. The time being 5 p.m. on the 1st of December. I'll call to order the regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and ask the secretary to take the role. Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Severson. Present. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Commissioner French. Here. Commissioner Forney. Here. Vice President Vita. <laughs> President Kogil. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I'll ask for a motion to approve the agenda. A vote. Second. I have a motion and a second for approving the agenda. I'll note uh, that I have uh, notified. Chair Forney and the Admin Finance Committee that all commissioners will be appointed to that committee this evening for the purposes of um, voting on and presenting amendments to the budget. That'll ask if there's any discussion. Seeing in, I will ask the secretary to take the roll on the agenda. Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have seven ayes, two absent. That carries. I'll ask for a motion to approve the minutes. We have two sets of minutes from Wednesday, November the 3rd, and November the 17th, 2021. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second on approving the minutes from those two past meetings. And I'll ask if there's any discussion. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. President Kogil. Aye. You have seven ayes, two absent. That carries. I'll turn it over to the superintendent for his report. Superintendent Van Gora, you can go ahead. Thank you, President uh, Kogil and commissioners. It's great to see everybody today. and uh, Some really great things to share with the board. Uh, we'll begin with aquatics. On Thanksgiving Day, uh, the Thanks Swimming event was held at the Phillips Aquatic Center. Uh, the participants swam 75-75s. Um, three laps basically, but on Thanksgiving morning, 
Uh, 21 swimmers chose one of 10 lanes to swim in. Uh, it was a great workout, and to start the long holiday weekend, registration was open, and charitable donations of non-perishable food items and gently used coats were accepted to share with the weight house for families in need. So, great event. Adult athletics and field permits. Winter registrations for adult sports is filling quickly, uh, with over 350 teams registered. Great turnout. Uh, league play begins in a few weeks, and we are looking forward to the busy winter season. Uh, golf. Construction continues the Meadowbrook, the Meadowbrook Golf Course uh, on the new clubhouse, and we are absolutely excited to have it open for the 2022 season. Uh, the temporary trailer that exists right now um, had been used as a clubhouse, or was used as a clubhouse, uh, was removed um, about two weeks ago. Columbia Northwest area of or Columbia's northwest area of the golf course had a great fall grow in after the large construction uh, project over the 2021 season. And as long as we have, of course, decent, uh, decent spring, we'll be open for the full 18-hole golf course in May of 2022. And again, if you haven't seen the construction project, it looks amazing. Uh, it's really beautiful. So great work from our golf crew. Ice Arenas. Great Ice Garden hosted the large Thanksgiving uh, youth hockey tournament last weekend, and despite the staffing challenges that we're facing uh, at the arena, Emily Wolf and the team um, there did a tremendous job uh, managing the events in large crowds. High school hockey games are starting up, and the arena moves into, as arena moves into its peak season. Um, new sports. Creekview had its first girls volleyball team at Creekview in over 15 plus years. Um, and they're absolutely loving it. And, and so congratulations. I know Nikki Friedrich is out there working really well, and uh, so we're glad to see uh, girls volleyball back uh, after 15 years. So registration is open for youth basketball, wrestling, and hockey leagues this winter. Um, there are, of course, COVID protocols in place for games. Um, our new hockey uh, girls' hockey day event registration is taking place Sunday, December 11th at Northeast Ice Arena. And we are, of course, encouraging any girls wanting to try out a game of hockey to register. So come on out and uh, participate. And we look forward to seeing you. Red Plus, McRae kids made turkey puppets to take home, uh, camouflaged hearts in honor of Veterans Day, and also made a shaped turkey face to go with the Thanksgivings to-go meals that the seniors received on the November 24th at McComas. So proud of them. Recreation centers. Northeast uh, Recreation Center, the gardeners, um, Rochelle Rao, uh, are always making our parks look great. The Northeast patio received a little sprucing uh, up this week with winter decor. Uh, Creepview. The, um, to reward the ladies uh, for their great grades from first quarter, we took the girls' group out on a field trip to Urban Air. They got a chance to um, let loose, jump, climb, uh, drive, and soar all over the place. They had a ton of fun, and as you can see, huge smiles captured uh, in these photos made it absolutely a perfect night for these young ladies. So congratulations on your grades. Well-deserved. So Community Center, youth, uh, youth participated in some fun STEM activities that involved art. They made a pendulum, painted, painted it, and made mazes for each other out of cardboard and straws. Uh, and they had a lot of fun. So I'm always excited to see science. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, at Central Park, Central had its 30, uh, 35, 7th, 30, over 35, 7th and 8th grade boys take, pay, I'm sorry, I think it's, they had 35, 7th and 8th grade boys take place in the Central Basketball Jamboree Clinic at open, uh, run, uh, open Run Gym Time at Central and Farview. They ultimately had a showcase of the top 20 players from the Open Runs, which took place on Sunday, November 21st. Great work there and great to see that group of young people out there playing. Full Service Community Schools. The Thune Arts uh, Magnet is going to pilot enrichment classes over winter break. The classes are free and will be led by community partners and supervised by Bryce Mack. He's the interim full service coordinator. 
at Bethune Arts Magnet. Classes will be offered in the following uh, acting and dance, basketball fundamentals instruction, and group games and gym activities. I'm also proud of the uh, continued uh, collaboration and services and programs that are being offered and great work by Bryce uh, on what he is doing there and connecting with the community. So great work. Scholarship fund program. Very proud. The Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board now offers a new scholarship fund designed to help more Minneapolis residents participate in a wide variety of MPRB recreation programs. The uh, scholarship fund is available to Minneapolis residents 17 and under and 55 plus with financial limitations. The scholarship covers all costs up to $300 per person minus a $5 participation fee uh, per activity. Uh, in addition to being included in the NPRB 2021-2022 budget, the scholarship fund is also funded through individual donations. Um, when anyone registers for a program, they are given an opportunity to make a tax deductible donation and any amount directly to the scholarship fund. I'm extremely proud of this and thank you to this board for support. Uh, this is really a wonderful opportunity for all of our young people who we don't deny anyone, but this is just another, another access to our wonderful programs and very proud of this effort. So again, thank you to the board and thank you to staff for all the work to make this happen. Forestry. The preservation of oak trees at the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden continues to be a high priority task for the forestry department. Without uh, ongoing efforts, the beautiful oaks would be killed off by disease called oak wilt. Thanks to the watchful eye of Susan Wilkins, forestry was able to assist by providing uh, the contractual services to fight oak wilt. In this photo, a, vibra a vibratory plow is being used to uh, sever roots so that the oak wheel cannot spread between trees. Thank you to your hard work of our staff there on that. Environmental management. Uh, soft shell turtle nesting study site update. Always exciting. Uh, this year, based on many requests from the public and staff to address crushed uh, turtles and destroyed nests, the MPRB contract, uh, contracted with an ecologist to learn more about the turtles found in Minneapolis and to propose ways to better protect these species. Staff had received reports of soft shell turtles nesting on the NPRB beaches, including Thomas Beach, but there was no data to support these observations. Wildlife experts uh, that were consulted about turtle nest protection doubted the reports that soft shells or more census turtle species were at Bede Makaska. A protected turtle nesting study site, uh, site to the west of Thomas Beach was installed this spring and soft shell turtles were observed and photographed laying eggs in that location. Amazingly, none of the nests in the study uh, area were disturbed despite Thomas Beach being one of the busiest beaches in our parks. NPRB staff worked with the contractor to launch a GIS based turtle sighting survey for the public to report turtles in the parks. 181 turtles reports, 180, 181 turtle reports were submitted with many of those being observation of the soft shell turtles laying eggs in the sandy shoreline area of Bidea Makaska, Lake Harry, and Cedar Lake. Through the winter, a report um, of best practices will be developed with the hopes of implementing strategies to support turtle habitat migration and park user awareness. Uh, just incredible um, and, and wonderful work for our uh, our team and uh, so grateful for this and so really exciting. Uh, asset management, maintenance operations. In the next several weeks, NPRB's outdoor skating rink will begin to take shape uh, due to the different landscapes in our parks. Hockey and broom ball boards will start uh, going up in some areas while other areas will see uh, teams beginning to prep the skating surfaces and placement of boards on top of the ice. Building of these rinks and skate parks or skate spaces is a big team effort, and you can see by the picture, um, including staff from carpentry, equipment operators, and park keeping staff. The upcoming season will have 40 plus sheets of ice to install and maintain, and we have a goal to have them up in time for winter break with, with of course, our cooperating weather, <laughs> which we have no control over, but that's our hopes. So again, thank you for our team. They do a great job again 
uh, with all of the rinks that go over 40 of them. And it really is a combined effort. So again, thank you to maintenance and operations for the work that they're doing around this and getting us ready for winter. Horticulture. November is the end of the traditional gardening season. So the horticulture team is busy winterizing gardens across the city. The biggest project of the fall season is winterizing the Lindale Park Rose Garden. Detailed park maintenance crew leaders, Molly um, uh, Hillebrand, worked with the crew uh, with the crew of park keeper trainees to lend some extra support to the Hort team to ensure that all the roses were properly winterized before the Thanksgiving holiday. Horticulture staff will continue to monitor uh, the soil and air temperature under the uh, uh, tarped beds to ensure the roses remain at an optimal temperature for dormancy going into winter. I'm always amazed by the science and the work that goes behind these things, just we have these beautiful gardens, uh, so great work. The horticulture team also used the end of the season to host two training events. The gardeners attended the uh, chainsaw operation training where they learned how to safely operate and maintain our battery powered uh, chainsaws. The team also attended a young tree pruning workshop with MPRB arborist Brian Boltz and Brandon Hall at M MLK Park where they learned how to properly prune young trees. Last but certainly not least, the horticulture team would like to, uh, to extend a big thank you to all our garden volunteers who supported us all season long. We hope to see everyone again at the garden next season. Thank you, thank you to our volunteers. We couldn't do without you. Wonderful work. Planning, Perkins Hill Park pump track construction. A mouthful. Uh, construction at Perkins Hill Park pump track is nearly complete, but due to weather and cold temperatures, it is on hold uh, until spring project staff uh, at the Minneapolis, at, uh, at Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board kindly ask everyone to stay out of the construction area during this time. Biking and walking at the site can cause, obviously, erosion on the dirt slopes and around the track. These areas are seeded with the native prairie plants that need to germinate and take root when the ground is thawed. Please help us protect uh, these seeds or the seeds so that everyone can have a great experience when the track opens next spring. Uh, construction will resume as soon as temperatures allow, of course, and we look forward to sharing updates in the spring and we'll announce a grand opening celebration. Really exciting, so I'm glad to see this is coming to you. Unfortunately, the weather kind of caught us, but we will have this up and running in spring. St. Anthony Parkway trail reopens under Camden Bridge. And there's, of course, a beautiful picture of it. The St. Anthony Parkway regional trail that has reopened under the Camden Bridge. The necessary repairs are complete after the section of the trail uh, washed out due to the, two, the 2019 uh, retaining wall failure. The repaired trail uh, features more uh, open views, fewer walls and fences, and a uh, regraded area uh, has been seeded with natural woodland mix of grasses and wildflowers. A new at grade pedestrian and bicycle crossing at 37th Avenue Northeast was also installed as part of the project. Repair work started in September and is now complete. The Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board appreciates tremendously the public patience while this important piece of public infrastructure was repaired. Thank you, and again, wonderful work for our staff, and uh, very, very excited about this now uh, being repaired and connecting our, uh, our residents again to this wonderful space. So thank you for this work. Meadowbrook Golf Course Clubhouse Construction Update. Really cool, a great picture to see the work that's coming along there. Construction is steadily progressing on the new clubhouse at Meadowbrook Golf Course. Construction is, uh, of the new 1,500 square foot clubhouse began on September 20th and will be complete in next spring of 2022. Clubhouse construction is on time with no unexpected delays uh, of materials. Grateful for that. Uh, work this fall included site utilities, building foundation, steel structure, roof decking, and wall erection. Um, the roof will be finished soon, along with installation of the new clubhouse expansive windows. Once the building is sealed for the weather, uh, work will begin on the inside. Stay tuned for more updates, and we'll see you in the spring. So again, we're doing great work with our golf courses, and this is just one example uh, of our efforts. And so very excited to see this in spring 
and uh, folks using this space again as they come out to play golf. Sibley Park Improvement Project. Everyone is invited, of course, to December 4th open house from 2 to 4 o'clock p.m. at the Sibley Recreation Center, Sibley Recreation Center, located at 1900 East 40th Street. The open house will be held indoors um, for which uh, uh, face covering is required and will be available to all who request them. So join the MPOB staff who will provide updates for the project improvements, which include learning more about uh, the community input on the park's future plans received earlier this year, and a review of input provided on a plan of the plan locations and layout for the playground and options for the poolside area. The staff will provide information on the design projects or process scheduled and the community engagement opportunities that will be offered this winter. And the staff will also provide information on the process for renaming Sibley Park and corresponding input received from community members of uh, on this topic. In addition, uh, residents will also, uh, community members also learn about plans for an upcoming workshop and the possibility for the park renaming. Of course, the details uh, based on the master plan, as you can see here. And of course, the red indicates, uh, the red circle indicates the improvement project area. Painter Park Phase 1 Master Plan Implementation. Uh, after six months of community engagement, including multiple open houses, pop-up events, and of course, online surveys, development of a preferred concept plan is nearing completion for implementation on phase one for the uh, Painter Park Master Plan. The Master Plan uh, was approved in 2020 as part of the Southwest Service Area Master Plan. The Painter Park concept plan will include a new skate park, gathering spaces, pathways, and landscaping, and reconstructed tennis courts uh, with, of course, pickleball striping and a, a reconstructed basketball court. The preferred concept plan will be uh, presented at a public hearing in early 2022. Very exciting. Uh, Loring Park Playground improvements and tennis court renovation. Uh, improvements to the Loring Park Playground started in October and will be completed with the fall with, with fall tasks by mid-December. The new equipment will be in place as well as, as, well as the engineered wood fiber um, surfacing. Once construction fencing is removed, the playground will be safe to play, will be safe to play on. Uh, resilient rubber surfacing requiring warmer weather conditions will be installed in the spring. Renovation of the existing tennis courts began in this, this fall at Loring and will be extended into the spring. After the winter uh, pause, construction of the final paving and striping, fence, fabric, and also the concrete walkways will resume as soon as weather conditions and material, avail uh, material availability allows. So again, very exciting about this coming this spring uh, to see the tennis courts, the playgrounds, all the work, it's just fantastic. So another great project that we're working on and looking forward to the use in the spring. Um, I think this is the last thing. Uh, CARE 11 featured MPRB's Logan Park Pavilion and its communities of communities that care segment. Uh, a portion of the CARE 11 news piece is as follows. Um, there's a new picnic and performance building at Logan Park, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, Logan Park Neighborhood Association, and local nonprofit Sparkwide partnered to create a new timber frame shelter at the north side of the park next to the Recreation Center patio. Uh, it was built this summer using the timber framing a method of construction, um, a distinctive style of building that uses carefully fitted timbers with complex joints secured by large wooden pegs installed uh, instead of nails uh, or other uh, mechanical fasteners. Thank you to our community and staff for making this new space a reality. And then here's a really clip, a quick clip from CARE 11. Uh, it's about two minutes in length. And so uh, if you could play that, please. Unfortunately, Superintendent, we had a few technical difficulties with that, but we will send it out to commissioners to see. So my apology. Oh, no problem. Thank you, Secretary Ringo. And uh, again, well, we have beautiful pictures that show this amazing structure. And again, uh, we will send this out to you so you can view it. It was great to be a part of a new segment. So uh, with that, President uh, Cogill and commissioners, thank you for your time. I'm always privileged and excited to present all the wonderful things we do in our park system. 
uh, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And so, again, thank you for your time. And we're open for questions. Yeah, thanks. We could ask the vice president, but she can't talk. Her voice. Um, there we go. There we go. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, all right. So I have here the next item of business, our consent agenda. We have a few minutes before um, open uh, comment period. Um, I'll ask for a motion on resolution 2021-356 through resolution 2021-358. So moved. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the resolution? Any discussion? I am not seeing any hands raised. So I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Bourne is aye. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have seven ayes, two absent. That carries Turn it over to reports of standing committees, um, Chair Meyer. Thank you. Um, I'll move to the resolution and there's an amendment that follows it. But I move resolution 2021-327, a resolution amending section 14 of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board rules of the board to establish the procedure for notifying the president or secretary of intended absences prior to a board meeting. Hello. Um, Uh, Commissioner Forney, was that a second? Or oh, a second, I apologize. It's been moved. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Commissioner Meyer. Um, I'd like to move uh, the proposed amendment that is in the packet on page 48. Um, it strikes uh, the language about um, any reference to having a reason for absences. So I'll just read what the full amended language would be. It says, if a commissioner is unable to attend a scheduled meeting of the full board or a meeting of the committee as a whole, the commissioner shall provide written notification of their absence to either the president or the secretary prior to the scheduled start time of the meeting. The absence shall be recorded in the meeting minutes if no written notification of absence is received by either the president or the secretary prior to the scheduled start time of the meeting, the absence shall be reported as an unnoticed absence in the meeting minutes. In the case of the absence of the president, the president shall provide written notification of their absence to the vice president. The amendment has been made. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. There has been a motion and a second on an amendment to resolution 2021-327. Is there any discussion to the amendment? Commissioner Meyer, would you like to speak to the amendment or? Yeah, um, this was just taking feedback from the last meeting. Um, um, Vice President Rita, um, 
uh, you know, objected to uh, having uh, to indicate a reason for why you're absent, so it just strikes any reference to that. It'll just make a distinction between whether you gave notice or didn't without uh, making any reference to reasons at all. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, any other discussion or questions from commissioners to the amendment? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to take the role of Commissioner French to the amendment. I just what 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 prompted this this resolution? I'm just if anybody is, is there a particular incident or something that prompted this resolution? Has there been a problem with this in the past? Uh, I can respond to that. Go ahead, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, just keep it brief, and then we'll go into open time. Yeah, I just think it's um, better for the president and for chairs of committee to um, be notified of any known absences so that they can make sure that there's quorum. And I, I just think it's a good practice. Um, and it's uh, common for outgoing boards uh, to fix problems in the rules and procedures for the incoming board. So I was doing that for them. Is, 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 is this the practice of the city council or the board estimates the tax, estimation taxation or the school board? Is, is this is, is that their policy as well? I, I just want to figure out what light boards are doing, uh, so we can have best practices. Um, I don't have any familiarity with the BEC or the school board, but I did talk to um, a council member who had uh, suggested doing this for the council because it's an, an issue there too. Is it a suggestion for the city council, or have the city council made that rule? It is not the status quo rule, but it is a problem there as well. Where people are being absent without saying why, or, or without notice. So is it some type of punishment or some type of punitive action that's going to be put? It seems like it's punitive, and I'm just having a I'm having a hard, hard time to uh, figuring out, uh, you know, what, what's, why, why are we being so punitive to commissioners who may or may not have other stuff to do? We all have other jobs, and we all have other stuff to do. Some of us have more free time than others. And it seems like we're being punished for the work that we do outside of the, of the board, and I don't think that's okay. So I don't see the, I don't see the rationale behind this, this rule. It is good to notify the secretary. I, I think that should be happening, and and the president. But I think this is a this is this is punitive. I think this is punitive. So I won't be, there, there is no proposed there's no proposed penalty. Thank you. Thank you. I won't be voting on this. Thank you, Commissioner French. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. The time being 5.30, we'll move into open time. We can return to the amendment and the resolution. We do have uh, a number of individuals signed up um, on the call-in for open time. We have six individuals, and it looks like we do have um, most, if not all, of them here uh, on the line. And so I will begin uh, that process. First, I'll note for those calling in, this is the opportunity for the public uh, to um, address the board on any topic they wish. We just ask that you uh, refrain from uh, discuss discussing any pending personnel matters and uh, refrain from using any discriminatory or harassing language. Uh, I will give every speaker two minutes to address the board. Please be cognizant of that time. You'll hear a beep at the end. Um, and if you're willing, you can state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record when you start off. With that, I will um, call up the first person. That's Cindy Jacobs. Do we have Cindy on the line? Cindy is on the line. All right, very good. Cindy, you can go ahead. You have two minutes to address the board. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Cindy Jacobs and I live in Shoreview. I'm talking with you today about the Sioux Line Gardens to protect and preserve the gardens by opposing the paved road plans put forth by Hennepin County. I'd like to share an experience with you. Last summer, I made a new friend at the dog park who told me about a public garden in Minneapolis that I hadn't heard of before. Being the inquisitive person that I am, I drove south to see it. When I got there, I was quite surprised and smitten, not only by the flowers and garden plots, but also by the garden's uniqueness, so different in look and design than other such places I had seen, and such a breath of fresh air. 
Not that I don't appreciate the city's parks, I certainly do, but they all follow the same formula for look and design. The Sioux Line Gardens are beautiful and unfettered, not only providing a display of flowers and greenness, but also giving education to inner city youth, teaching them about bees and bugs and dirt and where their food really comes from, also providing free produce for the needy and a serene and calming space for people such as myself. The question you may have is, why not this space for a road? The Sunline Gardens are an oasis in the middle of a city, and I truly believe that by bisecting it and chopping it up with a paved road 15 feet wide will not only diminish it in size and appearance, but make it impossible for the gardeners to use the hoses necessary to water their plots and gardens. More noise, bikes whizzing through, more people, a 30% loss of land, Fewer gardens, potentially lots fewer. It will not be the same. Minneapolis needs to protect and preserve its unique and beautiful spaces, much as they protect unique architecture and art. I often visit the Sioux Line Gardens and bring out, bring out a town guest there as well. They're always impressed. Hennepin County has better choices. Can I continue? No, Cindy, that is the end of your time. Thank you very much. Our next okay, speaker fine. is Caleb Crossley. Is Caleb on the line? Caleb is on the line, yes. Very good. Caleb, uh, you can go ahead. You have two minutes to address the board. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Caleb Crossley. Um, I'm representing Putsaw Society in Whittier neighborhood tonight in support of the um, 400000 uh, Minneapolis Park Dedication Fund dollars going towards two futsal multi-use courts at Clinton Field. So I just wanted to give some brief background about what I do uh, in the neighborhood with Football Society. We're a small nonprofit that offers free competitive soccer to 150 kids participating in our programs. 92% um, were born outside the U.S. across 14 different countries and five continents. 92% identify as black African American. Um, we aim to invest in our community, amplify the voices of young leaders, and offer free soccer fan experiences at Minnesota United Games in partnership with Tickets for Kids. Um, we do it uh, for equity and accessibility, uh, to promote healthy living, uh, mentorship between our volunteer coaches and participants, and belonging for our immigrant participants. We believe with the designated outdoor space, we can increase our capacity to serve youth of all ages and offer more programming all year long. Um, this has been four going on five year project in 2016, we started futsal programming at Whittier Rec Center. In 2017, we uh, proposed futsal court at Central Gym Park. 2018, plans fell apart due to uh, final stages due to a corporate logo requirement. Uh, in 2019, we advocated for these futsal courts to be included in the Southwest Area Master Plan that was approved in 2020. And this year, we have gained support from um, Colleen O'Dell and Adam Marvitson. Um, for best, uh, President Cogill uh, and the Whittier Alliance to include these funds into the 2023 Capital Improvement Program. I just want to um, share Carlos Guareca. He's a member. Um, he wasn't able to make it tonight to comment at the last minute, but I think he does a good job of summing it up. Um, there has been considerable... Well, if you could just wrap it up. I know you're speaking for another person, but if you could just yeah. wrap it up. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, so Carlos says, there's been considerable interest in futsal as demonstrated by the number of participants at Futsal Society over the past years. Many participants are from the Whittier neighborhood, but many travel across the Twin Cities just to participate. The level of engagement from community members is impressive, and it's been sustained through continued relationships. I think this alone speaks to the potential for community impact if that access can be extended year-long. Having a multi-use court would provide Whittier and Postal Society a venue to continue connecting with the youth of our community. That's Carlos. Thank you so much. Thank you, Caleb and Carlos. Our next speaker is, um, forgive me if I get this wrong, Okateki Dakwa Agyekum. Is Okateki on the line? The caller is on the line. Very good. Uh, you may go ahead. You have two minutes. You can state your name and if you're comfortable, your address, and uh, you can address the board. Uh, 
Um, try one more time. Is, is Okateki on? Uh, they are on the line, and this they are in the meeting, and they are unmuted. Um, okay. Hi, uh, I am here now. Uh, sorry, I was telling you, you, you were talking to me for a <laughs> second there, but I'm not good. Go ahead. Uh, thank you um, for allowing me uh, a few minutes to uh, give comments here. Uh, my name is Okitichi Dakwe Jakum. Um, I live at uh, four. 504 Xerxes Avenue, South Minneapolis. Um, I'm here today uh, mainly due to my affiliation uh, with First Health Society. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, for me, I guess um, the courts um, um, represent, obviously it's very obvious the athletic activities that um, the courts would um, facilitate being accessible to the community. Um, but beyond that, um, I think you know organizations like Food Health Society have already demonstrated that there's a lot of um, interest in um, those um, facilities within the community. Um, but beyond those athletic um, activities that it would facilitate, um, I view these as an, uh, these courts as an investment in um, civic engagement um, within the community. Um, we, as an organization, have um, through the pandemic. I uh, still organize our um, futsal sessions, um, indoor sessions with our um, participants all masked. Um, and it's been interesting watching, you know, the kids have been during the winter, um, how, much how much they anticipate those sessions, um, watching them queue up due to um, um, COVID um, restrictions. They can't enter the building all at the same time. They have to wait outside, sometimes in the cold, just to have the chance to be masked and play uh, futsal for a little bit with their friends. Um, but they all look forward to it, and we've had um, great participation during a very difficult time for them in school and in the community. Um, so I, I guess I view it beyond even the athletic um, activities that um, that this would be facilitated, and it's also an investment in um, civic engagement within this community. Um, and that's all I had to share. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, our next speaker is Bishar Mohammed. Is Bishar on the line? The caller is on the line. Very good. Uh, Bishar, uh, you can go ahead. You have two minutes to address the board. All right. So my name is Bishar Mohammed. Go ahead, Bishar, you can continue. You have two minutes. All right, so my statement for today is we'd really appreciate if we could get those new futsal cards because it would really help us bring many teenagers together within the community. And we have seen it happen with Futsal Society. It's been amazing so far. So you hitting those fields would just make the experience much better and the community would grow into a much bigger space where everyone feels welcome to be in it. And then I have another statement where I have a friend that went to work, so I'm going to say her statement for her. You hear it? Yep, go ahead. So she said, for society for the last four years, has really helped get in the weirder Somali community to come together and get access to free programs there aren't many places they can go to feel like they are wanted and safe. If we can get two futsal courts in Whittier, it would mean the world to the young com community looking for a safe place to play. And that was Leila Dick. Fantastic. Um, Thank you so much, Bishar. Uh, I, I still got a minute, right? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I was one of the first... Uh, Smart teenagers that came into the community with Food Society, and just you know, just being me, me being the only one, and then with me like inviting other friends and that were within my community that didn't have the opportunity to play football anywhere else since there wasn't any courts around. Um, it was amazing to bring them, and then with it was amazing to bring them to Food Society, and then just. It just grew so much, and it was all about adults. Now it's just all teenagers that are around my age that have bright futures. So I think it would be really amazing 
if you guys could help us and get those football courts, you know, just so we can build that and get more teenagers who, who don't have the money to be, like, other places, you know. But there aren't really courts around Minneapolis, you know. Everywhere you got to go, you got to pay money and stuff. So uh, with many of us coming from a background of, like, low-income families, we really need courts. And we'd really appreciate them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Bishar. Our last uh, speaker signed up this evening is uh, Alexander Cato. Uh, is Alexander on the line? Alexander is on the line. Great. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm here. Yeah, you minutes. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander Cato. I live at uh, 646 Polk Street, Northeast Minneapolis. And I am here representing Twin Cities Bike Polo. Uh, bike Polo is a sport similar to hockey except played on a bike. We've been playing in the Twin Cities for the last decade and currently play at Central Gym Park in South Minneapolis. Uh, so I'm really just hearing continuation of the comments that Caleb Crossley and others made around the park dedication fees to Creamfield Park for the football and multi-sport courts in the 2023 CIP. And really just um, just wanted to express my full support of that. Um, for our sport, it's always challenging to find places to play. Um, and we're really excited that uh, the park board um, and other stakeholders are starting to consider um, just kind of dynamic and new ways of using facilities. And the multi-sport court uh, nature of the futsal courts is also conducive to our sport bike polo. Um, so we're just really excited to, co to collaborate with the uh, upcoming design process and just expressing our full support. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. That concludes our speakers for open time this evening. I will close the uh, open time and return to our regular agenda. We were discussing the amendment to Resolution 2021. 327. I'm wondering if there's any other comments or questions to the amendment. I see Commissioner Vaughn's hand raised. Commissioner Vaughn, do you have a comment to the amendment? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, President Cogill. Um, to the amendment, um, I, I had a question for uh, the amendment maker, just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, and I think I think that I am. And then just a question for staff. So, so Commissioner Meyer, like, all this does is create, right now we have two classes of attendance. So we have a binary class of attendance, present, not present. This creates three classes, present, noticed absence, unnoticed absence. And I, I think to Commissioner um, French's concern, I, if I'm understanding that correctly, there isn't a punitive piece in there. So this says, the way this would read now, it says, shall do this. If this doesn't happen, the notice is, or the, the action or corrective action is, is that it just goes in the record as unnoticed versus notice. Am I, am I understanding this? Am I understanding that correctly, Commissioner Meyer? I think that's a fair description. Then uh, Deputy, Super, Deputy Superintendent, um, I just have some tech, technology capability questions uh, on this. I know, like, Minitrack is not a product, like, it's an out-of-the-box product. I, I think there was some customization for us, but other entities use it. Um, it is this something that we can track in Minitrack? Is, is there an out-of-the-box strategy? Is it, like, so I know that there have been problems with Minitrack in the past with, like, misrecording attendance records based on like when committee membership changed and I'm just wondering if the what what technological resources would would need to be brought to bear in minute track to be able to effectively carry this out can it do that today uh, president Cogill commissioner Bourne Go ahead. thank you um, well the good news is is that by February 1st of 2022, we hope to be using a new product called AgendaNet. 
<clears throat> we're in the process of building it right now, so we'd be able to incorporate this new functionality into the new software. It, is it an out-of-the-box feature of that product, or is it something that we would have to pay for a build-out? President Cogill, um, Commissioner Bourne, I do not anticipate we're going to have to pay for this build-out. Okay. Yeah, if, there, if there's not a financial implication to it, the, the I, I don't see an issue with it. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to do much one way or the other. It, it, it doesn't seem to do much one way or another. I, I still have some concerns that it might be used as a tool by some folks to, like, weaponize people's tragedies or things or, or, or things along the, that nature but it's definitely that it, I think this resolution or this amendment does address some of that um, I, I, I do know that folks that follow this entity and folks that have sometimes sat on this board do tend to take some things out of context to weaponize it, and I, I would just be concerned about that for future boards. Um, but it really, if it's just an administrative classification, the I, I don't see a problem with it. So I'll, I'll support it. I think it's better than it was. I think it still could cause some issues in the future, but that's a uh, future board can address it. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Any other comments from commissioners? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll on the amendment. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. No. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. No. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. President Cogill. Aye. Um, just for the record, uh, Vice President Vita has lost her voice, so I can see her saying aye, and I can see an affirmative thumbs up, just so folks can see I've recorded that as an aye. You have six ayes, two nays, one absent. The amendment carries, uh, and now to the full resolution, and that's uh, hands to Commissioner Bourne. Thanks. I'll, I'll just speak briefly in favor of the entire resolution as amended. Um, having this in place four years ago would have saved me a lot of work for the two years that I was president. Um, there, I think different commissioners communicate with different presidents in different, in different ways. The, I did a lot of work on trying to get quorums in, in meetings. Unfortunately, it wasn't a problem in those two years. I know President Cogill also worked equally as hard to get quorum in meetings and that it was a challenge a few times. Um, the, I think it would have saved a lot of work for myself, for President Tab, for President Walensky, for President Cogill. I really do like the amendment that was put forward. Um, I, I hope people use this resolution in good faith and in good, and in good governance and don't try to weaponize it. Um, but it, I, I'd encourage unanimous support on this. I, I think it, the, I, I think if used in good faith, it's a good governance tool for the board. And it would have personally saved me a lot of work from a few of the commissioners that I didn't hear up when I was trying to get uh, when I was trying to get quorum. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Any other comments from commissioners? Commissioner Severson. Uh, thank you, President Carver. I will not be. Commissioner Severson, we're having trouble hearing you. Unfortunately, many things have been weaponized through our 40 um, the park board out of all places. 
Um, I, I don't think. Um, Commissioner Severson seemed to go go off there. You were getting stronger for a moment. If you could try again uh, with your comments, it could be a bad signal. All right, one more time here. Commissioner Severson, if you're still on, you can unmute yourself. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass since I'm having technical difficulties. Sorry about that. Uh, all good. We can we can hear you now. If you wanted to continue, otherwise, I'll. I, I was uh, just stating that I won't be supporting this this evening. Uh, many things that weren't meant to be weaponized have been weaponized on our park board uh, the past four years, and I just I don't want the new board to have to deal with any of the issues uh, that we had to deal with. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Steverson. Any other comments from commissioners? Questions? Seeing none, I'll. Um, Ask the secretary to take the roll in resolution 2021 three. Um, wrong place. 2021. Um, 327. Thank you, Commissioner Musich, as amendment as amended. Um, Commissioner <coughs> Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. <laughs> Commissioner Severson. No. Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Meyer, I believe that was an aye. Yes, aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. No. Commissioner Forney. Commissioner Forney. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Vice President Vita. Sorry. It's recorded as an I, President Cogill. Hey. You have six eyes, two nays, one absent. That carries right over to Chair Forney. On behalf of the Administration and Finance Committee, I would like to move Resolution 2021-350, Resolution Authorizing a Cooperative Agreement between Lincoln County and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board for cost participation in design and engineering of a segment of the East Bank Trail on Main Street between First Avenue Northeast and Hennepin Avenue Northeast, a part of the Central Mississippi Riverfront Regional Park. Resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Okay. Resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly say I'm really pleased about this. This is a really dangerous area for pedestrians right now. I'm looking forward to the improvements that are coming here. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, any other comments or questions from commissioners? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll on resolution 2021-350. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That carries. A move resolution 2021-351 resolution authorizing an additional alloca allocation of $234,805 to Schaefer Richardson from future park dedication fees paid in the North Loop neighborhood area for improvement of the North Loop Park site. 
Second. Resolution has been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the resolution? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Hi. Commissioner Musich. Hi. Commissioner Severson. Hi. Commissioner Meyer. Hi. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. I believe that was an I. I. Sorry. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. It's recorded as an aye. Um, President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That carries. Turning it back over to Chair Ford. I'd like to move Resolution 2021-352, Resolution placing the into nomination, the name Bridal Vale Gardens for the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board property known as the tower side site and initiating the formal name uh, park naming process as required under policy resolution has been moved is there a second second the resolution has been moved and seconded is there any discussion discussion any discussion seeing none i will ask the secretary to take the one Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Vice President Vita, recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That carries. Turn it over to Chair Meyer for planning committee items. I move resolution 2021-353, a resolution accepting the non-appointed citizen advisory committee recommendations and approving the concept plan for Jordan Park. All right, second. <laughs> the resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the resolution? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. <laughs> Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That carries, Chair Meyer. I move resolution 2021-354, a resolution approving the park concept plan for Upper Harbor Terminal Site within the above the Falls Regional Park. Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the resolution? Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, I will uh, have one question if uh, to follow up on some of the discussion um, at our last meeting. I'm wondering if uh, council has any update on the um, pending lawsuit associated with the project on the city side. Council Rice, do you have yeah. anything you could share with us or no update? Uh, yes, Mr. President, we, we looked at it again after the last meeting and we don't, uh, we don't see this as being a, um, 
Okay. Council raised your mic, Senator. Okay. I, I think I've got it on now. But I, Mr. President, after the last meeting, uh, Ann Walter and I conferred uh, with the city, and um, we don't see uh, this directly affecting anything that we would do. Um, the matter has not been enjoined. The city can still proceed. They're handling the litigation. I think our exposure risk is uh, extremely limited. As we understand the case, it doesn't implicate what we're doing with the parkland. Um, I think that going forward, it will take some issue, effort on behalf of uh, the uh, park board uh, staff and commissioners working with the city to um, ma make sure this can stay on a time label, the t a timetable that uh, gets this thing under construction within the next couple of years. It's taken a while, and um, everything just seems to move slow with government. But I think we're okay, Mr. President. Thank you, Council. I'm not seeing any other hands raised or questions. And I will ask the secretary to take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That carries. Moving into unfinished business, I'll ask for a motion on resolution 2021-359, a resolution revising the wage freeze for all positions in the appointed employee group for the period of June 4th, 2020 through to December 31st, 2021 to allow for a 1.5% wage increase retroactive to July 1st, 2020, a 1.5 wage increase retroactive to January 1st, 2021, and a 1.5% wage increase retroactive to July 1st, 2021, consistent with represented and non-represented positions during the same Almost. period. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Any discussion? See, oh, um, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Hogill. I just wanted to confirm with the superintendent that this resolution makes everybody whole going backwards. There's not there's not anybody that that is now left be, that's left behind or left out of that that's made sacrifices during the pandemic. President Hogill, Commissioner Bourne, that is correct. Well, thank you for uh, thank you, President Hogill. Thank you, Superintendent, for bringing this forward and making sure that does come forward and yeah, we did have a lot of employees that put themselves in harm's way in the midst of the pandemic and uh, this really truly was an oversight I think on everybody's level and we're glad we could we're glad we could make it whole for everyone that did make sacrifices for the organization and for our park users so uh, thank you thank you Commissioner Bourne any other questions or comments from commissioners Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. <laughs> Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. <coughs> Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That carries. Moving on to our final item uh, of the regular board agenda. Uh, we have some new business. Uh, I'm asking for a motion on resolution 2021-368, which is a resolution revoking all permissions for use of Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board parkland immediately adjacent to water bodies upon sale transfer of ownership or other conveyance of a property. 
Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, thank you. Uh, I will briefly speak to this uh, since I did bring it forward. Um, this uh, has to do uh, with um, just ensuring that um, moving forward, we are consistent with the mission and vision of the park board, which is to protect and preserve park land, um, including around park uh, water bodies. We have a few um, uh, private um, properties that are adjacent to our water bodies um, and have um, legal encroachments. Um, and uh, this does not impact them in the near term, but upon sale of those encroachments, this is a um, simple way to address what has been a long-standing debate um, uh, across boards for uh, a long time, as I understand it, um, and to be clear about um, improving that land so it is uh, for and by everybody in the city. Um, and I see a few hands raised. I'll start with Commissioner Forney. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I, I really appreciate this, this resolution. I think it's spot on. Um, I did have to ask around to make sure that there's no, shall we say, unintended consequences. Uh, such as the water taxi people did ask, you know, whether or not it impacted them. And I feel assured that uh, this is um, the prudent, proper way to go and um, really appreciate you putting this forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. I just had a, a question for staff about this because I feel this seems to be um, pretty mild. Like, if we have the authority to do this, I mean, I, I would support just revoking encroachments now um, for all these properties. Um, so I just wanted to ask staff, like, do we have that authority, and do they have any thoughts on on that idea? So for Michael Schroeder, do okay. okay. the superintendent um, and whoever he would like to answer that question. Yeah, thank you, uh, President Cogill, Commissioner Meyer. I will defer this to you, um, Assistant Superintendent uh, Schroeder. Uh, has great knowledge and background on this. Uh, well aware of the uh, all of this, but again, I would defer to Michael Schroeder to kind of uh, walk us through that. President Cogill, uh, Commissioner Meyer, it's it's a, a, a really fair question. Um, what this does is it puts us it, it will put us in a position of notifying all of all those encroaching properties of an eventual intent to reclaim the parkland. Um, I think that is a significant task for staff to have to identify all those and make proper notice. Um, the, the, the task of immediately revoking would be even a, a greater burden on staff, given that right now we don't know how many there are, and we would want to make it universal across the system, so we'd want to make certain we didn't miss any in this process. Um, we also um, believe it may be necessary or desirable to actually put some kind of a document in the title documents for the county. So that in itself, amending the, the, the property deed for all of these properties to indicate that there is this revocation uh, potential is, would be significant. So while it's possible that we could do this all at once, um, it would be a significant burden on us currently uh, to do this. I think that as, as it's posed, doing this as they come up for sale or there's a transfer, some other conveyance. I think it's a more reasonable way for staff to be responding. It doesn't preclude um, the, the, the board from taking up an action to more immediately remove any particular um, uh, encroachment or, or permission to use that land along a water body if it becomes necessary. Um, well, I will certainly support uh, taking this step forward. I hope, you know, it'll probably be the future board, but I hope the board in the future will go further and uh, revoke all the encroachments immediately adjacent to bodies of water. Um, I did also have people um, reach out to me uh, under the belief that this was going to affect uh, the water taxi. Um, you know, hearing Commissioner Forney here heard the same things. Um, you know, I, I had told them that I was willing to postpone this consideration of this to the next meeting if, if there were comments on that. But hearing that, hearing the confirmation that this doesn't affect the water taxi, I'm, I'm willing to move forward with it tonight if other commissioners want to. Well, for me, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, 
thank you, President Colgill. Um, it, it does get us there. I'm nervous that it gets us there in 70, 80 years. Um, the, are, are there any, is there one thing that I feel like we've not heard consistent messages on it, is whether or not, because this is largely, largely along the river and along the chain of lakes. There's not a whole, I mean, there's a few things along the creek, but um, like, are there, are there any unpermitted uses of like docks or anything along our uh, long bodies of along our bodies of water right now? Because I've heard different answers to that. Superintendent or Assistant Superintendent Schroeder, answer that. Um, President Kogio and Commissioner Bourne, an unpermitted use is different than what's being addressed here. An unpermitted use doesn't require us to go through an action to remove it, we could simply remove it. So it would be separate, be a different kind of an action from what's going on uh, relative to this resolution. Okay. So if, if I'm understanding the question correctly. I, I, think, I, I think you got the question, but I don't know if there was the answer to my question. <laughs> to my question. I, I, the, are there, well, let me be like a, a little plainer, I guess. The, I took a canoe through the chain this summer every dock that I see on Cedar Lake currently has permission from the park board to be there. Uh, President Kogel and Commissioner Bourne, I couldn't say that for certain. And I okay. think that, that, that's why I, w I would want to make certain that, um, that we could do some kind of a survey to analyze that before I tell you for certain. But certainly if there was one that didn't have permission, we could immediately take actions to remove it, even without this resolution. So, that, so that, th this addresses people that have documented permission, whether it's an encroachment or an easement or a license that they could produce and say, this was issued to me in 1984. Like President Kogel, Commissioner Bourne, that's exactly correct. In fact, many of these um, exist significantly before 1984, if I remember correctly, as we looked at some might date back to the 1940s. So, so yes. So with, with all permissions, that to me, are, are there... In, so that to me, I'm hearing like encroachments and easements along with that. And and can we can we revoke an encroachment or an easement that's written into a, the that's written into the deed of the land already? Um, President Kogel, um, Commissioner Bourne, you're you're correct. It's written as all permissions, uh, particularly because we have variously called them encroachment permits or licenses or encroachment licenses. And rather than repeat each one and potentially miss something that a document that might be 60 years old might have used, a term that might have used, we, we uh, phrase this as all permissions. Um, relative to your question about easements, easements are different and easements run with the land and they cannot be revoked. Um, we would have to go through some process of negotiating with a, uh, an easement holder to extinguish an easement from that rec from the title record, title document. Do we feel pretty confident, like the known knowns in here? There's not a lot of, we're not talking about a lot of easements. As, as we, as you and I take our canoe through the channel next summer, we're not talking about a lot of easements. We're talking about some sort of permission. President Kogo uh, and Commissioner Borden, you're correct. I think, I can't think, I, I can think of one easement that we have worked on in the last seven years, not, and it's not a lake fronting easement that we've dealt with the residential property. Okay. We've always used the thing that's a, a license which is, which is revocable. And, and encroachments are, encroachments are time certain. They're, they don't run with the land in the same way an easement does. So an encroachment is also a permission that we could revoke. We can send notice today and say we are revoking this 99 year, or we're revoking this upon sale or convenience. President Kogel, Commissioner Bourne, that's correct. Um, think, and we, we don't really know how many we're talking about, but we're talking about a lot. Like, I guess that a lot is subjective. We don't know how many we're talking about. Uh, President Bourne and Commissioner Kogel, I, I think you've characterized it correctly that most of these would exist probably in even a smaller portion of the chain of the lakes, probably along the Kenilworth uh, Channel and along Cedar Lake. We think there are also some 
that are a little more remote from a water body if you consider a diamond lake. Um, so we, we think that there's, um, uh, uh, th th there are a number, I, I couldn't put an, an exact number to it. It's not unmanageable for us to, to get an initial count, but to get an exact and definitive count, it might take us a while. The, um, and this work, it, this work is scheduled to be, is scheduled and resourced to be done in the, at least for uh, Cedar Lake, is scheduled to be done in the master planning process, correct? President uh, uh, Cogill and Commissioner Bourne, the master plan will give us guidance about how we deal with those encroachments, um, but it doesn't, I don't believe the master plan is actually dictating uh, that those encroachments be removed, but this would give us the ability to do that concurrent with an approval of the master plan or at any time, on any other time um, outside of the, the sale transfer conveyance. I thought that there was a budget action that came forward last year that was approved that that resourced staff to actually go out and find some of this work. Am I, am I making that up or misremembering that? President uh, Cogill and Commissioner Bourne, uh, I, I, I actually I don't remember. I, I don't okay. recall that, but it, it may it may be true. I don't remember. But you're not resourced to do it now, regardless of whatever the. Not that I know of. Okay, um, Council Ace, do you have anything to do? You have anything to add or context that you can provide that can help me make a decision on this? Council Ace, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. President, Commissioner Bourne. Um, I, I agree with um, what uh, Mr. Schroeder has said. I mean, this when uh, President Cogill brought this matter uh, forward. Um, I think it's timely. I think it's appropriate where the board has got the uh, land management policy out for consideration. Uh, this issue has uh, been before the board in one form or another for as long as I've been the legal counsel. Um, uh, uh, President Cogill's uh, predecessor, Patricia Baker, died in office and she was uh, prepared to take uh, maybe more drastic action, but for 25 years now it's kind of languished. Um, I think this is a good step forward. We are par primarily talking about uh, Cedar Beach, I would say. And I would say that most, from what I recall looking at this issue, many of those permits were issued decades and decades ago. And it seems like a practice has sprung up to the old give somebody an inch and they'll take a mile or they'll take shoreland and put in a dock and even more. Um, so this action would at least put those notice, as I read the resolution, it would be up to the staff to give notice to all those property owners that if they believe they had permission to the extent they have it, uh, it, it won't be able to be transferred. Um, as a matter of law, no party can adversely possess property against the government at any time, no matter how long they're there. Um, so if the board wanted to move ahead and reclaim the property, it could. I think this is a good step to uh, put out a marker by the board to say this is public property. It always has been. It always will be. And uh, if you are going to advertise your property as Lakeshore or there's a dock or something, you don't have that ability to do that. The, the board's not going to uh, tolerate that uh, action before. I think Mr. Schroeder's department has done a good job as it's worked through all of the issues around um, um, access to the parkways with uh, curb cuts and things like that. And with respect to Kenilworth, that area has been rebuilt and to the extent that any of those property owners had or claimed right to the land, it's not part of any of our plans now. So um, I, I very much applaud what uh, Commissioner Kogel is doing and would advise the other commissioners. This is a good path upon which to embark um, and as Mr. Schroeder has pointed out, there's many things a system could do, um, but it always takes resources, it always takes a plan, and, and I think this is the right uh, thing. The only other one I am aware of, there's one around on the west side of Diamond Lake, and uh, that came to light oh, when Gerben, uh, John Gerben was a superintendent, and we looked at it, and the determination was it wasn't such an encroachment or intrusion on parkland that it merited any particular action, so. Thank you, Council. Um, President Cogill, I, I'm not seeing anybody else with a hand raised. Can I just go into my second time to speak? Is 
I think. Uh, if, if you'd let me speak, maybe a little bit more, <laughs> sure. and I'll give it back to you here sure. for a second time. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the rationale Commissioner Meyer brought up, you know, the question about um, being more swift with this. Uh, the, uh, Commissioner Bourne also made a comment about how long this would take. Um, a couple of things that went into thinking about this. Um, uh, one is is that you know we have a, a variety of encroachments across the system. Uh, folks have purchased properties, understanding that they have um, uh, you know the ability to use that space uh, and has been communicated to them uh, thusly. Uh, actually, had an issue recently with something similar um, along uh, West. Uh, Lake of the Isles Parkway um, with an individual that thought that their encroachment for a garden uh, came along with the, the property and, and in fact it did not um, and uh, was upset by that but I, I think that you know again what we're trying to do here is be consistent but also um, be aware of what uh, property owners initially um, anticipated when they purchased the property. The biggest concern that I have beyond the fact that we need to ensure public access is public access and I hope that uh, folks who uh, will get this notice will recognize um, the, the intent and begin to remove uh, their uh, private facilities um, uh, in, with some haste um, is, is that you know some of these properties especially around Cedar have been advertised as lakefront property and that is just a kind of egregious uh, um, mischaracterization and the park board should be very concerned about that as we're trying to make sure that we're protecting all land that is public land. Um, so, so that's some of the rationale behind this. Um, and, and I feel also looking at sale dates recently around some of these locations, you know, a lot of these properties have changed hands over the last 15 years. I think we could reasonably expect that that um, may continue. So yes, it is not immediate. Um, but it is, I think, a prudent and rational way to um, move forward towards uh, a system that is uh, by and for the people. All right, Commissioner Borman, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, President Coyle. Um, so I, I think this is, I think the heaviest impact is in the President's district, and so I, I, I'm inclined to follow your lead as both the author and the commissioner most impacted by by this. But I, I do just want to throw out there just some feedback that I heard from Commissioner Meyer, when I think is also your sentiment and, and the sentiment of the entire board, it is the, there are going to be some scenarios where, where this doesn't, it, it doesn't happen for 20 or 30 years. And that really ties the hands of, uh, of future boards if we decide we want to put a trail around Cedar Lake. Um, the our our public uh, our land use policy is currently out for public comment. I got to see it a little while after we voted to release it for public comment, but that's out right now. That that and that policy documents a procedure to um, get licenses and encroachments and permissions to use parkland um, and. It, it seems to me like if if we kind of split the baby on this one and said maybe uh, a resolution revoking all permissions in X number of years, three, five, two years, if we were to come back and revisit this on the at our next meeting, it, staff would then be able to anticipate that in their budgets building up. The next board would be able to the next board would be able to anticipate that and build that into budgets. We'd then address them all at one time. Instead of like we we've gone through so we've gone through so many staggered things that are produced over the years like oh I have a document of this I have a document of this that's been a challenge over the years so if we just say in in three years it's done you can apply for a new one and then everybody's coming to the table in three years and then it it's done um, and it frees and it frees up Cedar Lake if the board, like, that's currently going through a master plan that might include a public trail, and it's our only major lake in the chain that doesn't have that. I, I'd hate to be waiting 15, 20 years on one house, 20 years on another, and it, it, so, so I wonder if the, 
uh, President Cogill, if you'd be interested in kind of putting the baby with Commissioner Meyer, coming up with a coming up with a different time certain date that is less than at the sale, but not tomorrow. Uh, so it gives staff a time to ramp up. And I, I would be really supportive of that. If, if you're not interested in that, I, I think you know the district better better than I do and you're most impacted. So I, I, I would follow your lead on it. Thank you, Commissioner Porn. I don't know if there was a, somewhat of a question there. Uh, you know, if it's the will of the board to uh, wait to discuss this uh, further at, a, at the next meeting, which would be the 15th. Uh, the last meeting of the year um, and come up with a different proposal uh, I, I think that that you know I'll be be open to that right now I I would support this um, and I think that um, you know broadly speaking it would it would be a, a fantastic step forward and also you know if there if it doesn't preclude uh, uh, future action to immediately remove encroachments. That's the right of the board. Um, so uh, if, if there's the desire to, to postpone and somebody wants to table it that to amend, that's, that's okay. I would like to support it this evening and I urge unanimous support. Commission, uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. Uh, I have a clarifying question for, I'm not entirely sure which member of staff, but uh, in reading this, I did not interpret it to mean that we were taking away the ability of any future board to immediately request removal of encroachment. Is that correct? I'd give that to Council Rice. I, I believe that is correct, but Council Rice, could you weigh in? Um, I'm trying. Uh, uh, yes, Commissioner Musich is correct. I don't view this resolution as precluding future board action on this matter. As I said, no person can adversely possess the uh, public's land against the public. So if the board a year, five years from now, had an immediate need uh, for the property, either to build something or just decided to remove it, that future board could do that. I think that it did. Okay, so if there's a master plan that calls for putting a trail around Cedar Lake and there's funding available to implement that, the board at that time would have the ability to notify the current uh, holders of those agreements that they're being revoked as of whatever date and we can proceed with building something. Yes, I would say generally that's correct. Okay, thank you for that information. I appreciate it. Um, I'll be some more supporting this motion this evening. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. I will have to um, uh, recess the full board at this time. We'll come back to this item. Um, it is just after 6.30 and we have a time certain Planning Committee item uh, uh, hearing, so I will turn it over to Chair Meyer. Thank you. Time being 6.34, I'll call the order of the Planning Committee. Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Musich. Present. Vice President Vita. Here. Recognized as present. Commissioner French. Vice Chair Forney. Here. Chair Meyer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Present. You have a quorum. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Mm -hmm. Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. Commissioner French. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have four ayes, one absent. I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm, something was going on with my computer. 
Is that an aye? Would you like to vote on the agenda? Aye. I'm sorry. Okay. You'll Thank you, Commissioner French. Five ayes. That carries. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021? Come on. Secretary, please call. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have five ayes. Thank you. Uh, we have a public hearing for the Key Wade and Park Phase 1 improvements. Uh, we'll entertain the resolution first and then hear a staff presentation and then proceed to public comment. Is there a motion for resolution 2021 at 360, a resolution approving a concept plan for phase one improvements, an, ag an agreement with Minneapolis Public Schools regarding existing facilities at Kuwaitan Park? So moved. Thank you. And now we have a staff presentation um, from Senior Planner Kalina Odell. Thank you, Chair Meyer and Commissioners. Um, there we go. So this is the resolution for Kuwaitan Park Phase 1 improvements. Next slide. So Kuwaitan is located in the south service area in the southeast corner of the city in Park District 5, and it's next to Lake Nokomis Community School Kuwaitan Campus. <clears throat> you can see on the city block picture here, the park is on the right side, the school on the left. And the CIP called for phase one, if this to include a play area, climbing wall, and decommissioning of the wading pool. The funding for this project comes from two years of NPP 20 allocations, as well as a Hennepin Youth Sports Grant, which is specifically for climbing equipment. And the timeline, um, we began engagement in spring, carried through summer and fall. And in fall, we released three uh, initial concept plans for public review. And we have since whittled that down to the preferred concept plan you will uh, look at tonight. We're hoping to bid the project early next year and construct it in the summer when school is closed. And I will mention here that I had initially asked in the uh, resolution that it go to both planning and full board on the same night. But at that, that time, there was not a second December meeting scheduled. So if there is now a second December meeting scheduled, I would formally with, withdraw my request for that. Next slide, please. So this is the Kuwaitan Park plan that was included in the South Service Area Master Plan adopted by this board in 2016. And you can see, as I mentioned before, that yellow dotted line down the middle divides the city block into park on the right and school on the left, except for two park facilities that are located on school property. And that's the smaller old uh, play area and the waiting pool. So the South Service Area Master Plan uh, called for the following things on the right, listed on the right-hand side here. And in phase one, we hope to accomplish removing those facilities off of school property, focusing on the southeast corner of the park and building a new play area with three types of play, traditional, nature, and adventure climbing. And that climbing is a bouldering type, which is the first of its type in the MPRB park system. And that master plan specifically calls out for no aquatic facility to be located in this park. Um, I want to point out here that when we began talking to the uh, school board this spring, they indicated they would prefer to keep the small play equipment area that's close to the school for recess. Um, and that is why this resolution also includes a legal agreement to that effect. The school board did not want the pool, so that legal agreement uh, also discusses removal of the pool. I also want to point out here that when the South Service Area Master Plan was done, um, it did look at all previous planning, including a 2012 plan that had uh, suggested moving the pool off of school property in, into the southeast area. So that has been discussed as part of the South Service Area Master Plan, but that uh, Community Advisory Committee was weighing uh, balance of aquatic citywide, the equity of that, and the fact that there are already wading pools at nearby Boston and Morris Parks, as well as Nokomis Lake to the west of this park. So it was determined that aquatics would be removed from Kiwaden, and instead there would be a focus 
on this new sort of exciting bouldering climbing element which wouldn't uh, occur anywhere else in the parks. Next slide, please. So community engagement for this project included in-line, or sorry, in-person and online events, uh, postcard mailings, email blasts, we have a web page. There was even a newspaper article written in the Nokomis Messenger for it. Um, you see some photos here of our in-person engagement. There's also a word cloud showing some of the responses from our online surveys. And you'll note that in addition to boulder play, zip line slide, nature play, it also mentions keep the pool. So there are people um, who would prefer that the pool remain. And we have heard that from the beginning of the project. Um, but given the uh, directive from the South Service Area Master Plan, we are going to be removing the pool at this time. Next slide, please. One of the exciting things of this project is just the opportunity to engage with kids, and I wanted to share with you some of their great ideas. We asked them, what's fun about playing in nature, and what's your idea for a new play area? And you can see climbing trees, towers, bridges, zip lines, um, slides, swings, and even finding mushrooms and finding frogs. So a lot of great energy from the kids that we talked to. Next slide, please. So I'd like to turn it over to Bruce Chamberlain with our consultant HKGI. Bruce, are you on the line? He's going to talk about the concept plan. I am, Colleen. Thank you. Um, so the, the concept plan that is before you for consideration takes into a, account a number of things that were identified in the Southwest Service Area Master Plan and um, really focuses in on the things that Colleen mentioned around adventure play nature play, and especially climbing. And uh, the plan uh, works hard to think about the circulation routes and especially the access route from the school to the playground and from the rec center to the playground. And uh, incorporates universal access really throughout the park, um, but especially those primary routes where um, kids will be coming kind of en masse from uh, either of those two facilities. The concept addresses um, the grade change that exists on this site. There, um, some of you know that there was a, a bank of tennis courts that was here that sat on this site. And it's kind of a plateau at street grade, and then it drops away to the fields just to the north of this site. And the, the concept plan uh, digs into the grades a little bit to create more interesting topography in this area um, and uh, really naturalizes that topography a little bit more than exists today. And then creates some interest, some elevation, as well as some, some low areas. We worked closely um, with uh, police and made sure that we had good sight lines into the playground and into the play facility kind of throughout, especially from the streets on either, um, either side, either 31st or 53rd on this area. One of the things that we really focused on was space for adults, especially parents, obviously. There's a treat area just to the left of the circle that you see in the play area. And that treat area um, is a great spot for some uh, picnic facilities as well as just um, diverse types of seating. So we've incorporated um, a lot of that into the concept, um, especially around that uh, two to five or small kid nature play area adjacent to it. So uh, that's a big part of what we heard from the community around shade and around seating. Uh, so that's incorporated. One of the things that we've addressed also is stormwater. Right now, stormwater is handled in a really traditional way throughout uh, this park. And we'll be looking at some innovative stormwater approaches and infiltration basins as part of the concept, as well as um, pollinator gardens and uh, naturalized landscape throughout. Uh, next slide, please. These two cross sections represent um, a couple of different views uh, th or slices through the, the new playground. I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, one is that it illustrates the intent of the concept to kind of carve into those existing grades and uh, use the soil that's taken out of one area to create a little bit of a, a berm or a ridge in another spot. I also want to point out the different uh, climbing components that are part of this. Uh, we've really focused a lot on the diversity of climbing uh, opportunities from bouldering 
to some of the structures that are on the site and proposed within the concept. So you'll see a lot of that within these cross sections and kind of how they fit into the landscape. The other uh, thing I want to note is that we have incorporated safety fencing or perimeter fencing on the two street uh, edges to ensure that kids who are on the playground um, are more contained within that playground area and parents have a, a, a fighting chance to track them down before they make their way to the street. So with that, I will turn it back over to Colleen for any closing comments. Thanks, Bruce. Really no closing comments. Just next slide is contact information. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Thank you both for that presentation. Uh, we do have, I believe, one person uh, who signed up to speak and then 10 additional people who submitted written comments. Do we have Joe Sandcamp on the line? We do. Uh, Joe, uh, you can speak for up to two minutes. First, uh, tell us your name and address, and then you can proceed with your comment. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Joe Sankamp, and I live at 3100 East 52nd Street. Uh, my family uh, and I live across the street from Key Waden Park. My wife, Takako, and I have two children, an eight-year-old daughter who attends Key Waden, and a five-year-old son. We are frequent users of the park. We walk to the school and we walk to school through the park every day and play there often. We've lived in the neighborhood for over 12 years with a daughter at Key Waden, having relationships with many neighbors. My job as an elementary school teacher in the Minneapolis Public Schools, I feel qualified to speak about Key Waden Park. The plan for park demolishes an excellent and heavily used waiting pool in the summer of 2020. This part of the plan, the plan makes no sense. I'm here to ask, encourage, plead this board to keep the waiting pool at Key Waden Park. I represent one of the families in this neighborhood, neighborhood who want to keep the waiting pool at Kiwaden. My message to you is simple. Build the currently planned play area and keep the current pool. Talk to the school board if necessary. Since finding out about the plan for the elimination of the pool this summer at a school event, I've tried my best to get the pool back into the plans. I emailed Commissioner Musich multiple times, spoke with the project manager, Colleen O'Dell, and the principal of Kiwaden School, attended planning sessions both online and at the park. I also took on the task of informing the neighbors. This is the part that is most disturbing to me. I personally spoke with rec center staff, families, parents at the school, and many families in the neighborhood. Almost no one knew about the plan to eliminate the pool. They hadn't paid enough attention back in 2015, 16, when the plan changed and the pool was removed. Maybe I'd missed the surveys or the notices, but when I talked with my neighbors and then started talking to families using the park and put posts on Nextdoor app, none of us knew about the change in the plan. They learned it from me. At the very least, we should have known. We should have been involved after talking to all these families and posting on Nextdoor, I can tell you that there's a huge support for this pool. The reason that there's been a pool at Kiwaden Park for 100 years is because it's in a perfect location. The families use it and want it at this neighborhood park. Uh, now, Colleen O'Dell told you that she gathered lots of, there were multiple avenues for feedback, and I agree. She did a great job. I talked to her multiple times. Um, they had planning sessions at the park. They talked to the kids at the school. They had Zoom meetings. That was all done. I give them two thumbs up. The uh, planners listened to the feedback. They took the feedback and they changed the plans. Very well done. If the same level of outreach had been done in 2015 or 2016, there would have been lots of feedback to keep this pool. I asked Commissioner Musich or Ma Manager Odell if they'd received any feedback about keeping a pool in the plans this year. I assure you they've gotten it. Families have written in, into surveys even without the water question. They've shared their frustration at feedback events and many people have emailed into this meeting to express their support for the waiting pool. The premise that there was no support for this pool is simply wrong. Finally, the greatest reason Thank for you, Joe. The your, your time has elapsed. Thank you, Joe. Please. Are there any other speakers on the line to speak in person? There are not. Okay. Uh, Secretary, uh, can you please read the written submissions for up to two minutes each? I can. <clears throat> the first one is from Trish Larson. Please, please don't take away the waiting pool at Key Waden Park. The lake is great, but the pool is so much easier for the quick cool down with little kids. Even for a parent who has a little baby, one parent is enough to safely supervise another sibling in such a controlled and safe little pool. Climate change is making access to clean, safe water area more important than ever. Please don't remove this wonderful neighborhood amenity. Next message is from Linnea Johnson. 
I agree with Joe Sandcamp, keep the waiting pool. Also, I give music lessons. <laughs> Next message is from Heather and Chad Stako. This message is to convey how much we have enjoyed using the Key Wade and Waiting Pool over the years with our four children. Our families who might not have already, uh, might not have ready access to ways to cool off on hot summer days, it has offered hours of safe, good old fashioned fun for the little ones in our neighborhood. We are disappointed to learn of the plans to remove the pool, particularly in light of climate change which will be making our summers longer and hotter, giving parents more, not less of a need for local cooling off options. Removing a well-used feature of a neighborhood park also seems contrary to Minneapolis's emphasis on livable spaces accessible to all its residents. We respectfully ask for the future of the Key Wade and Waiting Pool to be reconsidered for the benefit of our neighborhood and its children. Next message is from Shannon McGinnis. I am writing to share my support for keeping the beloved waiting pool at Key Waden Park before the public hearing Wednesday. It is possible to keep the waiting pool and, and build the play area. The board is claiming that there isn't enough community interest or support in the pool, but that is simply untrue. I went to the waiting pool with my children most days this summer and it was always being used by children and families of all ages. When I talk to my neighbors, they do not understand why we are getting rid of the pool. This includes people with and without kids. Why are we getting rid of something that has been, that is being used and enjoyed by the community? As a mother of young twins, I find the plan so disappointing. To take away the waiting pool and add no other water feature makes no sense to me. I especially worry because the new plan offers little of our, for, little for our city's youngest citizens, unlike the waiting pool. I do not understand why the board is not listening to the community that lives in the area. <clears throat> when I wrote to Ms. Odell, she responded with a, it is what it is reply that brushed off my concerns and told me to go to Boston Park waiting pool or Lake Nokomis with my one year olds if we wanted to swim. Neither of these are safe or functional alternatives. When I mentioned that, she never responded again. This is the person that survey listed as the person to talk to. I just did not get it. Thank you for taking a second um, to step back and reconsider. The pool is loved and losing it will take a lot away from the families who live there. Next message is from Katie Nolan. As a parent of the neighborhood, we live one block away. I have feedback regarding the plans for renovating the Key, Key Waden Park. Please do not remove the waiting pool. This is a great pool. Removing it would be a huge loss for our neighborhood. The next closest pool, Boston, is quite far, especially for little ones, and it isn't nice. The splash pads at Wabin and Hiawatha are also quite far and very busy with lots of rough older kids. And the lake is close, closed more and more frequently each, each summer. Please do not develop the parkland or at least consider scaling back the development. A climbing area would be nice, but the city is removing green space at a rapid rate and is getting harder to find. And <clears throat> what's little that is left is much more crowded. Kids need open space to run, trees for shade, and flora and fauna need space to grow. Storm water damage equals mosquito breeding ground. Storm water drainage equals mosquito breeding ground and garbage receptacles. Please just leave the, the large area of grass plants to absorb water. I don't understand why the city feels the need to engineer every square inch of land in order for it to be enjoyed. I would love to see more nature, trees, and plants incorporated into our parks instead of man-made structures and paved ground. Thank you for your time. The next message is from Angela. Um, McKittrick, please keep the pool at Key Waden Park. This space is accessible to all ages and abilities and is a positive and inclusive gathering space. The pool area provides a sense of community and continuity. Minnesotans love their lakes and water. How many city kids have cabins they can retreat to in the heat of the summer? The pool area is cool and clean. It is enclosed and easily monitored by caregivers. For families in this neighborhood, it is easy to walk to. Other pools are not nearby and are already crowded. Even though the lakes are closed, water quality in city lakes is questionable if swallowed. 
Preserving and restoring the pool is more sustainable and reduces consumption. It is intact and in good condition. Maintaining and preserving the pool is better for the environment. I have studied the plans, and while the upgrades are exciting, removing the pool is not an improvement. Please reconsider. I raised my kids in this neighborhood. We frequent the pool daily. Leave it there for more generations to enjoy. The next message is from Catherine Clays. My name is Catherine and I live nanny in the Ken, or Key Waden neighborhood. Over the summer, I brought the kids I nanny to the pool several times a week. Most people in the neighborhood that I've spoken to do not support getting rid of the pool. It seems as though you are not listening to the concerns of the residents in the area. Please consider redo the playground, but keep the Key Waden waiting pool. Thank you. Next message is from Matthew Hilgart. Dear Minneapolis Park Board members, the quality, interconnectedness, and diversity of park assets is what drew our family to live in Minneapolis more than 10 years ago. We are thankful for the historic investments in the city's park system as well as a thoughtful, caretaking preservation of assets throughout the years. A park system should provide a diversity of resources to all visitors, but especially be reflective of the community that surrounds it. I can say unequivocally that numerous and grow that numerous and growing families that surround Key Waden School Park not only use the cool pool frequently, but seemed it is a huge asset. <clears throat> Closure, demolition of this pool is not synonymous with community needs sentiments and has not been properly communicated to those who will be affected. The park board should be focused on preserving valued community assets rather than seeking alternative seeking alternatives community members do not support or have asked for. Please reconsider the plan to accommodate this preservation of this valued resource. Next message is from Nate McGinnis. I am writing to express my opposition to the removal of the wading pool at Key Waden Park. I have reviewed the proposed plan for the park and am a bit confused as to the thought process behind removing the pool and not replacing it with another water feature. The school has a well-functioning playground available to all residents, and the principal of the school has expressed their intent to secure funding to expand and upgrade the playground equipment. With this in mind, it seems duplicative for the park board to build another playground nearby. The bouldering facilities proposed for the new park would primarily serve the same age group as the school playground facilities, making them duplicative and redundant. The only thing being accomplished with the new park plan is reducing the facility's availability to younger residents. The waiting pool, on the other hand, is unique to the neighborhood and serves a much larger community than the proposed park plan. <clears throat> it is for these reasons that I request you reconsider the decision to remove a water feature from Key Waden Park and replace it with facilities that are redundant, age restrictive, and less accessible. Listen to the residents and keep the waiting pool at Key Waden Park. That's the final comment. Thank you, Secretary Ringgold. I'll now close the public hearing and open for questions and discussion from commissioners. Commissioner French. Yeah, my, my camera's not working too well right now, so can you please, uh, I'm, 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 I'm uh, super curious of why the decision to remove, to remove the pool. That's like the first question I have. And I'm, I'm asking it because as a former Code 8, I uh, spent many, 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 many hours outside of a, you know, supervising wading pools at Logan Park and at Central, and they are used and they are, they are focal point of most neighborhoods. I don't know about Key Waden, but I know that the, these wading pools, they're, first of all, they're free, and so there's something enjoyable for folks who don't have an opportunity or, or, or money to go swim at the Y or other places like that. Uh, I just, I, I'm having a hard time trying to figure out why we are uh, getting rid of getting rid of, a, of amenity. How we came, how we came to the decision that this 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 amenity wasn't uh, wasn't desired in this neighborhood. How do we how do we come to that decision? Thank you, Commissioner French. And I had the same question. Colleen, Colleen Bruce, can you expand on the reasoning yes. behind the pool? Yes, uh, Chair Meyer and uh, Commissioner French. Thank you for that question. Um, and I will uh, give you my understanding of the 
of the South Service Area Master Plan for Key Waden Park. Um, but if Adam Arvidsson wants to weigh in with any additional information about that planning process, I, I welcome that as well. So when the service area master plans are done, they're taking into consideration, of course, the entire area as well as the entire city and balancing out the recreational offerings that we have. Um, this area being a small park, um, had a couple things going uh, for removal of the pool. One is the park was small. The pool was fairly old at this point. It's nearing the ed end of its lifespan. It's on school property. It's not on our property. So uh, it needs to come off of their property. They recently expanded their building. Um, they were interested in keeping the existing play equipment, but not interested in keeping and maintaining the existing pool. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and when the, uh, the Community Advisory Committee looked at the entire service area, they saw a, a waiting pool three blocks away to the south at Boston. About the same distance away uh, is the lake, Lake Nokomis. Morris is a little bit farther away, and Hiawatha a little farther away. But it's an area that is not um, necessarily underserved in terms of aquatics. And so it was determined that this would be the site that would not have it, and instead have something unusual and interesting in this bouldering option. I hope that that answers your question, makes sense, and if Adam Arvidsson has anything to add, please do. Director Arvidsson, did you have anything to add? Uh, Chair Meyer, uh, Commissioner French, um, I, I really don't. I think um, uh, Ms. O'Dell has, has described uh, this properly. I, I, I do want to emphasize, too, that this, um, that this pool, um, as Ms. O'Dell noted, is um, nearing the end of its useful life. It is, it is not an accessible pool. Um, and it has a below ground vault, uh, which uh, creates a lot of maintenance challenges. We have pools of this age uh, that have already failed. Um, and so we are concerned about the longevity of this particular pool facility. Um, and then uh, in addition, I think um, just reiterating that we, we do have a, um, a very small park here and the pool does not exist on park board property. So we have to be uh, cognizant of that as well. Um, um, but otherwise, um, I, I have no uh, further comments on the on the background of the South Service Area Master Plan. Thank you, Commissioner French. Do you have any additional comments? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just you know I, I'm I'm really you know it's not about us. We're literally taking away something that it seems like that's near. Before I even heard the public comments, I, I was trying to figure out why we were taking the take, taking the uh, pool away. I, is there some other is there some other concern besides that? Why are we just rehabbing the pool? Why are we can't can't enter in discussions with the uh, the school board to figure out and let them know that this is a beloved entity in the community and a beloved uh, amenity in the community? And you know, three blocks may not be anything to folks when they're doing planning work, but it, it can mean a lot when you're a nanny or a grandma taking care of the kids or just a parent with a, a bunch of young young folks. Uh, and so, I, I really would like to really reconsider, uh, I, I don't have a problem with most of this, the plan, but we really need to reconsider and figure out some other options, whether, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we have some pretty bright minds here at, at the Park Board Planning uh, in the Planning Department uh, to, to take this, this amenity away, a water amenity, which is, I'm going to tell you, man, in the summertime, that's, that's what kids love, to go and get wet and do stuff that they can't do at home, and to take that away, uh, we, should, we need to have a really good alternative. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French. Commissioner Musich. Thank you, Chair Meyer. Um, I've been asked by residents why it is that we can't just keep the pool until such a time as it fails or the repairs um, necessitate removal because they're too expensive. Is there some reason that we can't just hold aside the amount of demolition funds until such a time as the pool fails? Thank you, Chair Meyer and uh, Commissioner Musich. My understanding, again, I will ask our, uh, Director Arvidsson if he has any additional information on that, is that the um, allocation for Key Waden, um is for 2021 and that if we had to hold off um, until later to do the pool, it's quite possible that it could be years and years and years before anything is rebuilt of any kind. 
Um, that's my understanding for why we can't just hold off funding until later. Director Arbison, was there more to add there? Was that? Um, as Chair Meyer, Commissioner Musich, um, I maybe want to clarify the, the, the question or the idea that Commissioner Musich just raised. Um, are, are you saying to, um, to take a portion of our current project budget and essentially put it, put it aside for now until which time the, the pool may fail and, and then we would trigger the release of that 2021 funding at that time to, to remove the pool? Yeah, that is, that is what I'm asking. Is it possible for us to take um, capital improvement funds, earmark them for a future expense that we know is coming because we've had, how I don't know, five pools that are in this era that have failed in the past year um, so that we can remove the pool at such a time as it fails? Um, I... Theoretically, yes. I, I suppose um, it may depend on the timing and the extent of. Um, so these funds are are uh, coming from bonds, and I know that there are certain there are some timelines on bonds that uh, encourage us to spend that money sooner. But there may be a way to swap sources so that we could. Set that aside. I, I, I would I would have to think about that, and I'd probably have to check in with um, Finance Director Weisman about the, um, the functionality of that. I'm not sure I can answer um, definitively right now. Okay, um, so that's something I'd like to better understand, because I, I always have thought we had to spend um, bond dollars when they're allocated to us, and that we're in danger of losing them if we do not. Uh, so some clarification there would be helpful. Um, I do understand the rationale behind uh, where the South Service Area Master Planning Community Advisory Committee and staff and consulting group came to this from. Uh, this area is incredibly rich with uh, water resources and other portions of the city did not have that same wealth. And so we were creating uh, water amenities in parts of the city that didn't have them and reducing by only one uh, the, the water amenities here in this section of town. Um, that equity component I think is incredibly important. I do, I do intimately understand just how expensive wading pools are to maintain and uh, repair. I've had a lot of problems with that in my district during my tenure. So I, I do understand that we need to try to limit the number of these that we have in the system in order to keep the park um, in a place where they can be maintained with the resources that we have available to us. So uh, I will be supporting the resolution in front of us this evening um, before it comes back to the full board. I would like to understand whether or not there is an opportunity for us to earmark removal funds for a future date. Um, to be utilized when, when this infrastructure fails so that we are not forced to um, delay another neighborhood's project to remove failed infrastructure here because we chose not to. So um, if we can get more information on that before the vote of the full board, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Commissioner French, is your hand raised from the first yeah. comment yeah. or the second one? Yeah, you yeah, had another question. Uh, is, is, is the, what condition is the pool in right now? What, what, condition, um, what condition is the pool in right now? Yeah, sorry, toggling the buttons here, sorry. Um, uh, Chair Meyer and Commissioner French, it was built in 72 and upgraded once since then, so it is near the end of its lifespan. Um, uh, it's still functioning, but we don't know for how long. Has there been any problems in the last you know, five or 10 years with that particular pool? I would want to talk to, um, I would rather have uh, our maintenance folks respond to that question because I don't have all of the details on it. Um, because it seems like we have a pool, like if, if it's not a big problem now, right now with maintenance, 
if it's not broken every, you know, we we got pools across the, the, the system that we had out for a summer in a couple of pool, a couple of places in the system. And it, I, I can, I can't tell you how many emails I got. I couldn't tell you how many emails I got when we shut down. I think Central was shut down a year or two ago, and I think Logan was shut down last year. These are these are central places in our neighborhoods, and we've got to do what we can do, everything we can do to make sure that they stay in place. If it's not broke, don't fix it, right? And if it's and if it was, you know, had a bunch of repairs that needed to be done, I think that conversation could be had then. But I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think we just rip something out that's not broken. Right now. I know it's old, but if it's working and it, it seems like the community really enjoys it, let's cross that bridge about cross the bridge about whether we need to repair or replace it. You know, I, I don't know how long, how long, what, what do you think the life expectancy is it a? If I know you said it's past its its uh, use date. How many more years? If you looked at it. Is we have people that can expect it and see how many possible more years we can get out of this pool? Commissioner French, it sounds like those are questions that are that the staff is going to follow up on, and like Commissioner Musich mentioned, perhaps there's something to consider delaying that um, at, the, at the full board if it's possible. Is there also another way that we can enter into communications with the school board and, and see how they would like to partner up and making sure we keep in this keep this amenity? That's you know near and dear to folks in that community. Uh, in that community, is there is there you know some type of diplomacy that we need to be doing or reaching out to certain folks? I mean, is there a response to that or? I'm sorry again. I'm sorry. trying to juggle a couple things. Um, we have been in talks with the um, facility uh, staff of the Minneapolis Park, uh, School Board. Um, they're the ones that uh, did not. They asked for the play equipment and did not ask for the pool. Um, so are we paying for the play equipment? Are we paying for it? Uh, I mean, the, the park board's paying for the play equipment, right? it, it, It's already there. It exists. And so yeah. the agreement that's attached to this resolution donates the play equipment to the school. And then they assume ownership. They assume liability. They assume maintenance. Do they have a rationale uh, of not wanting the pool? What, what was their rationale for Besides um, just being on the property. Well, the the pool has reduced hours compared to other pools that are not adjacent to schools because we don't have the pool open while this school is in session. So yeah. it starts a little later and it closes a little bit earlier. And then that whole school year, that area is not playable or usable for schools in general. Um, it could be used as an open play space or something else. But um, it's also, since the school has expanded south, they did an addition on the school. It's moved everything really close in there. It's a very tight, closed close area. Um, so in our discussions with them, that those are the kinds of things that have come up. Um, so is it, is it a no-go for them? Is it like they don't, they don't, like they literally said, we don't want this on our, on our property? I asked them if they supported the removal, and they said that that would be fine. I, I guess I'm, who, who was the biggest Okay, are they are they pushing for us to remove this pool, or is this something that comes from planning, and we just ask if it's okay to do it? I'm, 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 I guess I'm not. Can I can I jump in here? My question. Yeah, Director Robinson. Sure, um, Chair Meyer, Commissioner French. Um, I, I want to be very clear that the the realignment of aquatics throughout the South Service Area um, was the result of years of community engagement during the South Service Area Master Plan. So this isn't an idea that comes from planning that we we just want to take this pool away. This is a, a, a rethinking of how aquatic service takes place in the South Service Area. There there are other places in the city and in this South Service Area, in the South Service Area that, that do not have this level of aquatic service that we want to add more aquatics to. And that is taking place um, uh, in other areas in the service area, for instance, a master plan that would add some aquatics to Cedar Avenue Field, where there is none today. Um, so, so I want to I want to make that background clear. Um, but but also to clarify the public school question, Minneapolis Public Schools does not operate outdoor aquatic facilities, um, and they they don't want to kind of be in that business. They do operate a lot of playgrounds outdoors, which is why they will take over the playground in this location. Um, but they have no interest in operating the outdoor, uh, the outdoor waiting pool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just having a hard time. Uh, you know, if, if, 
I, I'm literally hearing there was a, there's been a waiting pool there for a hundred years. And I'm not saying that, you know, maybe, maybe we need a little bit more engagement to see if, I, I don't know. It just, it seems, it's, I don't know. I, maybe it's my work as a, as a code for so many years to see how, how waiting pools are used and how, how much of a focal point they are. I just, I think we need to rethink it. Thank you, Commissioner. Chairman Meyer. Thank you, Commissioner French. Commissioner Musich for the second time. Thank you, Chair Meyer. I just want to clarify, I'm not suggesting in any way we should delay moving forward with adopting the implementation of the phase one improvements that are called for in this resolution. Um, I would really love to see this passed at our next meeting, um, especially that component of this, uh, because if we don't start the purchasing process, less equipment will be purchased to be implemented in this location. And what the public has said that they support and would like to see here um, is what we can do when the board approves this in December um, versus it being approved in January and getting pricing for 2022. So um, if necessary, I could see amending this resolution to retain the pool in its current location until such a time as it fails. Um, but again, I'd like to understand what the ramifications would be uh, for our ability to retain those capital improvement funds and um, if we were not able to retain those funds, what it would mean when it does fail and needs to be removed uh, for the CIP. Because my understanding is we had a number of failures this year um, that necessitated the CIP being amended and thus pushing neighborhoods out <laughs> in the plan from where they initially thought they'd be getting funding so that we could address those failures. I don't want to, um, I do not want to make a decision here that pushes other neighborhoods that are also deserving of improvements out further in the investment plan um, because we were unwilling to make a hard decision. So, Ask my colleagues to support this this evening, and if necessary, amend at the full board uh, to retain the pool in its current location until such time as it fails. Um, saying that the school board would be on board with that, I, I guess we may have to put a pause on, on that whole piece, but for the majority of these improvements, I'd love if we could move forward with that in December. It looks like Colleen has things she wants to say about what I've just said, so um, I can take a pause. Yep. Uh, thank you, Chair ahead. Meyer, Commissioner Musich. Um, I could offer uh, the option of using capital contingency to remove the pool later, um, since uh, capital contingency comes from levy, not bonds. Um, use the CIP line item called capital contingency. It's an annual appropriation, then we could remove the pool later. But the rest of this plan uh, the play areas could move forward. So we'd be able to amend this to say, <laughs> retain the pool until such a time as it fails, at, at which point contingency funding should be utilized for its removal. Yeah. I see people nodding. That's what okay. I'm thinking. So I'd be interested in hearing from my colleagues if that's something that they would support. Um, if so, I can work with staff on crafting that to submit for inclusion with our, our next board packet. Um, if people feel very strongly that we should just remove the pool at this time, I'm interested in hearing that as well. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Research. I'll respond for myself and that um, I will pretty much follow the lead of, of uh, you as the district commissioner if you see fit to propose an amendment to delay a uh, demolition to that effect until it actually fails, I, I would be willing to support that. Is there any further discussion on the resolution? I'm in agreement. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Anyone else? Seeing no further discussion, uh, Secretary Ringgold, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. Commissioner Musich. 
I have information. What what exactly are we voting? We voting on to? What's the vote? Are we voting on to to delay this or? No, no. This for the main resolution. It'll go to the full board after this. And the expectation is to is to amend it at the main board. At the main board, you can propose an amendment, or Commissioner Meech okay. could. Okay. All right. So, so if you have if you have thoughts on what that amendment should be, I'd be interested in hearing it now because I would be working on crafting it over the next. Okay. I'll I actually I'll work on it with you. Yeah, we've already called the roll, so let's pursue them. Awesome. Commissioner French. No. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have four ayes, one nay. That carries. The motion for resolution 2021-361, a resolution authorizing staff to proceed with the pilot project as initial implementation of the draft parked way toolkit at intersections along West River Parkway between 4th Avenue North and Plymouth Avenue. Okay. Take that as a motion. Uh, and we'll hear from Design Project Manager Carol Hillstone about this update. Thank you. Good evening, Chair and Committee members. Tonight, I will present a draft of the Parkways Toolkit and Pilot Project for your consideration. There is a presentation, um, and so if um, the Deputy uh, Superintendent Ringgold would, would pull that up. Thank you. Wonderful. So tonight, I will present a draft of the Parkways Toolkit and Pilot Project for your consideration. This project aims to develop a kit of parts that can be used to give greater flexibility, functionality, and aesthetics around the changing, changing the nature of use of parkways across Minneapolis, from vehicle-centric use to active human use for a temporary duration of time. Staff are seeking authorization to proceed to final design and implementation of the draft toolkit and phase one pilot project. Next slide, please. Parkways were created for the use and enjoyment of park users and are under jurisdiction of the park board. They are park land and were never intended to function as city roads or a public right-of-way. The Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board owns and manages 55 miles of parkways across the park system. They support recreation and access to natural areas that were originally planned and designed as linear parks that typically parallel rivers, streams, and lakes across the city. Next slide, please. Many parkways fall within the Grand Rounds Parkway System, which is an interconnected system of parkways across the city and is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. While parkways can be attractive for non-recreational motor vehicle trips, these streets are not intended for it through motor vehicle traffic. Next slide, please. Parkways do routinely temporarily close to vehicular traffic in order to support events, programs, festivals, construction projects, uh, environmental or natural resource needs, as well as park space needs. Currently, the number of events that change the nature of use of parkways is limited to two events per month for the policies and guidelines governing the use of the park system document. Next slide, please. With the onset of the COVID pandemic, the use of parkway segments to accommodate park space needs for active human use was brought to the forefront. This transition of use received a significant amount of appreciation, praise, and petitions for extended use from many users. The intensive resource needs to accommodate the transition of parkways for active human use was brought to the forefront during this time. Initially, the transition of use proved confusing to both active users as well as vehicular users and the signage and barricades are not particularly welcoming. This is not a criticism. It was relatively uncharted territory for park board staff and all users of parkways, not to mention during a very condensed time frame. I mention it mainly to highlight the opportunities for improvement which this project aims to address. Next slide, please. The Parkways Toolkit and Pilot Project is a consistent yet flexible kit of parts, including signage, that can respond to the unique site constraints and event types 
to temporarily change the nature of use of the parkway system. This project will enable additional flexibility in decision making for the park board. Changes in nature of use of parkways will be less resource intensive in terms of cost, labor, and time. Uh, the kit of parts would include tools that would reflect the aesthetic of the park system, including gates, movable planters, bollards, stanchions, water-filled jersey barriers, and welcoming and intuitive signage. Next slide, please. A pilot project is proposed for the summer of 2022 along West River Parkway between 4th Avenue North to Portland Avenue. This segment was identified as a top priority from staff across park board departments and partner agencies. This pilot project would be an opportunity to test and tweak the tools prior to deployment across the system and would provide tangible public engagement opportunities. Next slide, please. The $160,000 is allocated to study the parkway closures in the 2021 budget. $11,000 of that funding was used in the spring of 2021 towards barricades, cones, and signage to open two section of parkways, Lake Harriet, uh, around Lake Harriet, uh, as well as one lane along West River Parkway for walkers, bikers, and rollers um, while closing that to, to automobile traffic. To date, $55,000 has been allocated of this budget to account for consulting fees, staff time, and contingencies leaving a balance of $94,000 available for implementation of the pilot project. Next slide, please. If authorized, project next steps include final design of the pilot project, a review of the applicable park board ordinances and policies, development of project branding and messaging, acquisition of toolkit components and signage, implementation of improvements, and public engagement around the toolkit and pilot project. Next slide, please. With that, this concludes the presentation, and I'd be happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to start off with some comments and questions of my own, and then I'll turn to other commissioners. Um, so first, I'm, I'm pleased to see this come forward. I do think uh, West River Parkway is the most natural place uh, for us to start this pilot, uh, because that's where you have most 5Ks and other events. Um, but I, I wanted to ask um, why, why you chose the half from 4th Avenue North to, to Portland as opposed to the, the half from Portland uh, to 11th Avenue. Um, we, we, you know, I, brought, I brought that up with you earlier and just wanted to know what, you, what your thoughts were in, in choosing um, this side first as opposed to the other side, because the other side has a narrower sidewalk and um, it's sunnier. And it, it seems to me like the other side would have been the natural fit to start first. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. A great question, uh, Chair Meyer and, and commissioners. You know, there's a, a number of segments of Parkway that, that really would be great candidates. As I mentioned, you know, really we spent a lot of time uh, speaking with staff across departments within the Park Board and, and our partner agencies, all of whom identified this particular segment as, as truly the top priority that, that really would allow for um, a change in the nature of use, potentially for a longer term to allow us to really test out these tools and, and gain a lot of, a lot of feedback. It's a, it's a well-used segment. Uh, it does routinely, you know, close to automobile traffic uh, for events, as you mentioned. Um, and really, you know, the uh, site constraints here give us a, a, a nice amount of variety to be testing, you know, the particular tools to ensure that, you know, we, we would be able to tweak as necessary or would be able to, to better understand performance, you know, in the field. Thank you. And then it, the, the staff report included a lot of diagrams. Um, I don't know if you had any of those diagrams in your presentation ready to, to share on screen, but I, I just wanted to... Um, know more about those, those diagrams and if you could um, interpret them for us and then spell out what they mean. Um, like what type of different area ideas would work at different locations in this pilot area? So yes, the, the staff report did include some draft diagrams. Um, 
that I, I may be able to pull up, but really those are, are in such a draft state. Uh, staff are still reviewing those to provide feedback to a consultant to really refine those designs. And so I wouldn't want to go into too much detail. Um, that's really the first blush at looking at what a, a potential uh, implementation plan may look like. And so, you know, at this time, it, it's more seeking authorization again to move into that, that final design so that we can, you know, spend more time sharpening the pencils and, and ensuring that we really are considering all of the site constraints and traffic needs and, um, you know, kind of know a little bit better, you know, what the, the deployment of these tools would entail in this area. Okay. And then last question for me. Um, so if, if the board wanted to go the full distance to 11th Avenue, would it be approximately double or would there be additional expenses? Um, yeah, that, I'm just trying to get a sense of, of how much it would cost. Because I, I was hoping that this would be able to cover the entire downtown area. Yeah, that's, that's a great question, Chair Meyer and Commissioners. You know, we do have some preliminary uh, numbers coming in for what it would take to, to implement, um, you know, these tools between 4th Avenue North and Plymouth, and certainly would the board, you know, direct us to go beyond uh, this initial boundary and, 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 you know, implement further, uh, we can certainly look at that and come back, um, you know, with, with some actual numbers in terms of what would be needed to achieve that. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Forney. Thank you, uh, Chair Meyer. Um, I'm intrigued by this whole thing. Um, I, I, I guess, you know, I'd like to talk big, big picture um, a little bit more, but um, have we been in consultation at all with um, uh, the Chief um, Ohado um, about any safety, you know, considerations? Um, I just, you know, feel that that's <laughs> an imperative part, you know, as far as um, this project that you have. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Chair Meyer and Commissioner Forney, certainly we have uh, been in, in discussions with um, Minneapolis Park and Rec PD. Uh, in fact, one of uh, the officers is a member of our technical advisory group that's helping us to evaluate, you know, these draft tools and, and draft plans. And, and certainly we would, we would want to have their input and make sure that this is as safe and as functional as possible. Yep. Good, good. Yeah, I mean, I think that is really critical. Um, anyway, um, uh, I, I've talked with Chair Meyer about this, is that I, I'm really more concerned about a bigger picture um, of how, how our roadways, parkways are being utilized. Um, we know that um, a great deal of them uh, have become commuter routes, um, and if they're going to be commuter routes, um, and the city is not, how should I say, taking the load um, as far as uh, these routes, <laughs> um, we are, I think, they're fundamentally being used for a different thing, and I, I feel like we need to to to. Um, evaluate what um, how the various you know roadways are being utilized um, you know what, what's the, the the volume that's going on them and the reason why I'm saying that is um, uh, we've been receiving what is it 700 750 dollars um, a year for over 20 years um, for our parkway um, um, improvements you know and and <laughs> And yet, we've been taking on more and more and more of the capacity, you know, of, of um, uh, whether it be commuters or, you know, what it is and everything. And so, you know, I feel like there is some sort of construct that we can be making that, you know, if, you know, uh, West River Parkway is used as a commuter route and everything, then, okay, we should be compensated, you know, according to the degree of um, volume that we're taking. So. I don't know if this works into your your toolkit that you're you're doing, but I, I would hope that we would have those antennas out um, in in reviewing um, how our roadways are being doing. And you know, if um, 
whether or not it happens to be the city streets are not taking that capacity, whether or not it happens to be the county streets, whatever it is. Somehow we are not being offset by what we are, um, uh, how are our railways are being utilized. So um, anyway, I just hope that, you know, you will have that particular um, viewpoint as you are um, uh, going through this um, uh, pilot project. So thank you. Um, I look forward to hearing more about the process. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, Chair Meyer. I'm I'm intrigued with the concept of the pilot. Um, I did have to step away for a quick second to check on my son. Did we talk about a cost implication for to implement this resolution? Uh, these ones were already allocated at the beginning of this year. Yeah, Got it. The okay. Budget that we that we allocated. Okay. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure, Commissioner Forney's comment. I, I I agree with the sentiment there. I I think there was either a misstatement or um, or a misunderstanding. We do receive more than seven hundred and twenty dollars a year for. Um, for roadway construction and rehab, it's, it's certainly not enough. Um, but we do get several hundred thousand. Um, this board did work. The, this issue has been brought up for the last several years, and it didn't seem like something that uh, some board members wanted to work on at the time. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, I'm hopeful that the board moving forward will try to get those much needed funds from from the city's hands. Um, but also, I, I think if we're, if the question is whether or not, I, I, I first wonder how, how germane the first comments were to the resolution, but I, I do definitely wanna want to respond to them. It, if we do have park parkways that aren't designed as commuter roads and are being used for commuter roads, I, I, I think the, we have two options. We can make sure that they're not used as commuter roads or or get compensated for them. I I, I would prefer seeing them not used as commuter roads. And I, and I think we could start looking at design implementation. Like I, I mentioned before, like the, if you put speed bumps every eight to 10 feet along the parkways, you're, they're going to very quickly not be used as <laughs> as a as a commuter as a commuter roadway and still kind of meet the same intent. There's still there'll still be a linear park for folks that would like to drive four or five miles an hour. They could be uh, they could be truly parkways for everyone. You could really create a system where folks could walk along the parkways and still be there with vehicles. Um, you just wouldn't have that issue. Um, I, I think the speed uh speed limit or uh ordinance that we passed the other day like takes a step in that direction but but it's unenforceable so i just if the next board is going like this resolution is great I, i'm not sure what the previous comments how much they tied into this resolution um but i, I just kind of wanted to get some some facts and potential direction on the record I, i'm intrigued by this um I, I guess we'll see what it looks like when it comes to the full board on Commissioner Meyer. What's the date that is coming to the full board on the 15th? That's correct. Okay. Um, I'll give it some thought between now and then. I do have some concerns, but I'm, I'm intrigued. Okay. Um, can you share what your concerns are with it so we can work on them? I think right. in the interest of time, the, we can we can discuss offline. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I, I agree. You know, uh, that there's maybe a choice between pushing the city to increase the compensation if it's going to be a commuter route versus not having it a, a commuter route, and I would certainly support more speed bumps or a lower speed limit than the one we set if the legislature would authorize that for us. Um, you know, our, our legislative agenda doesn't come until February, which is an oversight of mine when I uh, spoke at the last meeting about that, but um, I mean, the, 
the next board that actually adopts the full legislative agenda. And if they want to push for a lower speed limit than the one that we uh, passed, I you know, would uh, definitely love to see that happen. Um, but you know, I, I think this is uh, a step forward. Not automatically here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that you know, enables staff to have some flexibility, um, and will hopefully enable um, you know closures to happen without the enormous expense um, that we had from the Combs and Mercades and make them look better. Um, as I've said before, this would be justified if it was only just the events that we've already done historically for 5Ks, July 4th, things like that. Um, but I would hope to see this um, you know, tested out for, for new possibilities. Like the big one I'd like to see is seasonal weekend closures, which is something that um, we saw historically. Um, and th this would enable that, that possibility uh, to be tested out. Um, Mr. Gordon, did you have any comments for a second time, or was your hand raised from just first? Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Being on, uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. <laughs> Recorded as an aye. Commissioner Musage. Aye. Commissioner French. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have four ayes, one absent. That carries and concludes our business. So if there's no objection, I will declare the Planning Committee adjourned. Thank you, Chair Meyer. I will now reconvene the regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Uh, we were discussing Resolution 2021-368. Uh, I believe there were a few hands still raised, so I'll just give a moment for anybody who had additional questions or comments regarding the resolution to raise their hand. Right, we have one person with their hand raised. Give me a moment. Commissioner Forney. <laughs> Thank you, President Coquel. I, I would encourage um, uh, my members to uh, so, well, commissioners to support this as is, I believe that staff has articulated very well that the burden um, uh, to document and, and, and move uh, anything forward, even in the next few years, um, would not be appropriate, and that we could leave it to the next board to decide and once the um, Cedar Isles Master Plan has been um, um, passed. So um, with that, I like to say I encourage people, please, both take for this. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Seeing any other hands, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. We'll pass. Commissioner Musage. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. You have seven ayes, two absent. That carries and um, concludes our business. Uh, go through communications at this time. Um, Commissioner Bourne. I will pass. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Thank you. Uh, 
Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Severson and Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner French. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about, I went to, uh, had a chance to actually go to the, the seventh, eighth grade basketball showcase at Central Gym. Uh, Cindy Wilson was the park director over at Central. Did an awesome job of getting about 150, 200 people together on a Sunday, Sunday evening and Good time, uh, kids and families, and uh, it, was, it was a fun time. And it's what our parks are for. It's, it's a gathering spot for for uh, our families, and had an awesome time. And I, I'd encourage other commissioners to go out and visit visit you know certain community events like that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French. Commissioner Forney. Thank you. Uh, I think we all are quite aware that uh, during the pandemic here, it, this has been an incredibly challenging time for. Um, staff uh, to accommodate um, all that we do as far as our business. Um, I know that for uh, Secretary Ringel, that um, just getting through the roll call has been um, a, a real burden and very difficult. So um, I, I just want to thank her for, you know, her tolerance, you know, of us. And I, you know, so I, I just want to behind the scenes people such as uh, Tim Dumas, um, uh, he makes it possible for all of us and everything. And I know that, of course, our, our shall we say, right hand, um, John Goodrich, um, uh, the incredible amount of work that he does running around with this and that and making um, so many things possible. And Molly, thank you for your um, uh, orchestrating our, our public um, uh, open time. And it, it really, to all of you staff, um, this has been a huge lift. Um, I'm sad that we won't be able to be in person um, between now and the end of the year, but um, just a big shout out to you for all of your um, your efforts in making this possible for us to do our business. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Um, Vice President Vita, I'm assuming, cannot speak, but I'll pause for a moment in case she wants to say anything. All right, uh, that sounds sounds like uh, she will not speak, and I'll just say I hope that uh, the vice president gets better soon. Uh, and now she's lost her voice, and uh, so um, sending her uh, get well soon wishes there. Um, I thank commissioners uh, for uh, the discussions this evening, and um, look forward to um, moving through the, the budget process here uh, with uh, our uh, committee meeting, which again I'll remind folks is. Uh, uh, for every commissioner, we've appointed all commissioners to um, the, the Admin and Finance Committee tonight for the purposes of making and discussing any amendments to the budget. And uh, for the public, a reminder that next week uh, on the 8th is when the board will um, consider the passing of the budget. Um, usually that meeting is held at City Hall, but uh, as Commissioner Forney mentioned, uh, all of our meetings through the end of this year at least um, will be virtual. Um, with our last meeting being scheduled for the 15th of December. And with that, I will uh, adjourn the regular meeting of the Park Board and turn it over to Chair Forney for the Administration and Finance Committee. Thank you. I'd like to convene the Administration and Finance Committee uh, here at 748. I am going to say right off the bat, um, as I just mentioned and everything, um, how cumbersome it is for uh, the secretary if we are always turning off our visuals on and off and everything. So I am asking that everybody keep your visuals on the entire um, committee meeting um, so that we can um, actually, it, it is something that is um, according to the open meeting law that we do need to keep our visuals on. So please, um, right now, everybody turn on your visuals. Point of information. Point information, Council Rice. Council Rice. Yes. And for, um, Commissioner French, we always already do have a rule that if somebody does point, have point a technical point information, issue, point information. They, they do not need to have theirs on. Point point information. Uh, uh, I just want to know is that a part of the open meeting rule that we have to have our cameras on? Because I do sit on other boards, and you're not required to put your camera on. So I want to. I just want to make sure. 
that we're not just being unnecessary chastised, which is what I feel like. And so I, I sit on other boards that are subject to public meeting laws, and we're not forced to have our camera on. So I'm I'm trying to figure out where this where this rule came from that you that you came and told this board that we had to have our cameras on. Council rights is that a, is that a, is that a rule? Because if that's the case, a lot of other boards are not following. Sure. What do you believe you need to call on Council Rice to respond to the point of parliamentary inquiry? Thank you, uh, Council Rice. Uh, point of parliamentary uh, procedure, and I am not trying to chastise anybody. I'm trying to make our. Uh, it, it seems that way, and it's, well, I'm getting a little. Unfortunate that it's taking that way. But I'm sorry, Commissioner French. It is a request that I'm making to make life easier for the rest of the. Um, the members as well as well i've already explained that my camera is not i heard that and it i think like we, we, we have we have it's, a rule it's that I'm a little bit redundant and I'm, I'm i'm getting a little bit it's frustrating okay so um i it, point I'm of sorry, inquiry chair it's already a point of parliamentary council um, right council right please um Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I think to uh, Commissioner um, French's question, as I understand the open meeting law, you, you are required to be on camera when you're discussing, when you're, when you're speaking or when you're voting. That's, that's my understanding, at least. Um, I think that uh, Chair Forney was trying to make another point, but it, I think legally you, you, your picture needs to be on when you're voting. And uh, also, oh, you're asking questions. My internet's not that good, so if I have my camera on, I don't. I don't. And I don't. I want to. I don't think that's a rule because I sit on a board of estimate taxation, and I never see anybody's face. And I'm really concerned that we're just being unnecessarily chastised. That's that's why I'm asking this question. Okay. Right Other now, boards don't do this. Right I watch city council meetings. City council members don't do this. Excuse me, but right now we are going to be taking the roll. Would the secretary yeah, please point of inquiry, Chair Forney? We will take the roll first. Point of inquiry, Chair Forney. Is this a request or a directive from the chair that video cameras be on? I am making a request that you do this, please. Out of courtesy, and the, the, out of out of transparency, please, secretary, please call the roll. Thank you for making that a request and not a directive. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. <laughs> Commi er, President Cogill. <clears throat> President. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Vice President Vita. Here. Marked as present. Commissioner French. Here. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Musich. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. Recorded as an aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan, Chair Forney. Aye. You have six ayes, one abstain, and two absent. I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of November um, 3rd and of November 17th, 2021. I'm moved. Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Bourne. 
abstain. Commissioner Musich. Sorry, Commissioner Musich. <laughs> President Kogil. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. Recorded as an aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. Aye. You have six ayes, two absent, one abstain. We have several action items. The first one is Resolution 2021-362, a resolution requesting the Board of Estimate and Taxation to incur indebtedness and issue and sell City of Minneapolis bonds in the amount of 800000 the proceeds of which are to be used for the disease tree removal program. Secretary, please call the roll. Oh, first of all, I should ask, is there any need for any discussion on this? Okay, will the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Bourne. Abstain. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. So, excuse me, Vice President, or sorry, Vice Chair Hassan. Commissioner French. Here. I mean, aye. Vice President Vita. Did you, did you... I did. Thank, thank you. My apology. Um, Vice President Vita. Aye. Recorded as an aye. President Kogil. Aye. Recorded as an aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have six ayes, one abstain, and two absent. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to move resolution 2021-263, resolution requesting the Board of Estimate and Taxation to incur indebtedness and issue and sell City of Minneapolis bonds in the amount of 11 million five hundred thousand for um, certain purposes other than the purchase of public utilities mm -hmm. just point of information um, who just for the record did commissioner Forney, did you move that or did commissioner me since you just said you were moving that or were you looking for a resolution i read it and uh commissioner music um Moved it. Okay, you, you said the words, I will move resolution 20. Okay, so. My apologies. Okay, just want to make sure I'm up on it. Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Bourne. I will abstain. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Kogil. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. You have six ayes, one abstain, two absent. You for a motion to uh, for resolution 2021-364, resolution setting the 2022 tax levy for the Park Museum Fund. Moved. Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Well, abstain. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. 
Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. Aye. <coughs> you have six ayes, one abstain, two absent. Looking for a motion to uh, for resolution 2021 at 265, a resolution adopting the 2022 Park Museum budget. Mm -hmm. Secretary, please. All right, I don't see any requests for uh, anything, so I will have the secretary um, call the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Okay. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Myers. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Abstain. So, was that an aye? I'm sorry. Abstain. Abstain. Thank you. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes, two abstain, and two absent. Thank you. Looking for a movement for resolution 2021 at 366, resolution setting the 2022 tax levy for the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Boom. Thank you. Um, not seeing any requests. Uh, will the secretary please uh, call the roll? Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner, sorry, Commissioner French. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. Aye. You have six ayes, one abstain, and two absent. Looking for a motion for resolution 2021-367, resolution adopting the 2022 Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board budget. So moved. Thank you. I'm still up. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Commissioner Meyer. I see your hand up. Um, thank you. Yeah, I have a proposed amendment to make. Um, this is on page 30 uh, in the agenda packet. That's for the amendment. Sorry. Um, so the amendment would be um, action to increase the Board of Commissioners base compensation to $20,000 annually for commissioners and $22,000 annually for the Board President and authorize an annual increase to commissioner compensation uh, based on the average percentage adjustments made across employee, employee units in each respective year and action to amend uh, the 2022 general fund expenditure budget to increase the Board of Commissioners' um, uh, 2022 budget by 43894 uh, including the increased commissioner compensation of uh, 73894 and the elimination of the workman lobbyist contract of 30000 and to reduce the provision for the wage insurance and pension adjustments by $43,894. I would request to speak to the amendment. Point of order, Commissioner Forney, or Chair Forney. Yes, uh, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, co Council, like I said, I, I would just like you to take a close look at the proposed amendment. I'm concerned that at least part of it is out of order. Um, the, the, the resolution, the, the resolution does two things, or the amendment does two things, if I'm understanding it correctly. The, the amendment makes a budget adjustment, but 
then it also takes another step to set policy within the budget that dictates future year budgets. And, and that, so, uh, Comm Commissioner Meyer, you can. Uh, I, I'm supportive. I'm supportive of the gist of it, but I'm I'm thinking that there might be another way that it needs to get across the finish line. So, Commissioner Meyer, if you can just make sure that I'm I'm paraphrasing it correctly. So, there's a there's an action to increase commissioner salary. There's a that then there's an action that directs future year budgets in uh, salary, which feels like that is more of a financial policy than a 2020. 2022 budget is 2022 dollars, and you're directing, you're making a 2023 financial decision in the 2022 budget. Yeah, uh, you might you might be right about that. Um, and we will defer then to Council Wright for his interpretation, please. Um, Madam President, to Commissioner Bourne's inquiry, um, I, I I think the Commissioner Meyer's motion is perfectly in order. Um, I don't, I don't see anything wrong. I mean, you, you do that all the time and you adopt the budget with perspective um, situations and how to set compensation. So I don't think, I think that it's perfectly in order. You, you adopt agreements to pay rent or utilities, things like that, that have an inflationary aspect. So I, I don't see anything wrong with this amendment. Thank you, Councilor Rice. Um, so Commissioner uh, Meyer, would you like to speak to your amendment? Yes, I would, and um, and I'll first I'll respond to that concern because um, it does the amendment does a few things. Um, you know, it increases the base compensation for commissioners to twenty thousand dollars, and then you know I, I asked for staff assistance uh, to draft this amendment uh, with the goal of uh, setting that compensation increase and basically giving instruction that the compensation would increase automatically with inflation, you know, after that, so that it wouldn't be, you know, a, a routine political football uh, to increase compensation going forward. And uh, the staff recommended this as the way to accomplish that uh, by basing uh, the compensation off of um, what other park employee uh, bargaining units are receiving. Um, if that had to be in a different policy, and if that's the nature of the objection, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind um, waiting until the full board meeting on December 8th to consider it. Um, but hearing Council Vice, it sounds like that part is not a problem. Um, so the the funds for this come from two different sources: uh, $43,000 from the general fund. That amount um, corresponds to roughly uh, the amount of inflationary increases. Uh, since the last time compensation was increased, um, and I would be willing to support um, that amount regardless of whether the other part is included. So if a different commissioner wanted to propose an alternative amendment, I would still support uh, that portion of it, which brings it to about $17,000. Uh, the remainder comes from the elimination of the workman lobbyist contract, and I just want to speak that quickly. Um, I've already spoken about it previously, but wanted to reiterate and expand on part of that and just want to say, first of all, that it's uh, the position there that I oppose, um, not the person filling it. If the position is going to be, be there, the person filling it is, is outstanding for the role. Uh, but I feel that we have a very bloated um, lobbying budget, and it's one that has expanded substantially. Uh, it was $140,000 a decade ago. The total amount is more than $230,000 now. We hired you know, uh, the new intergovernmental um, administrator. And, you know, that position is well over $100,000. And, I, I mean, I, I just feel from my experience as the IGR chair that those lobbying expenses um, are too much and, and not uh, worth the value that we're, they're putting in there. Because my experience was that it was really just a matter of getting uh, the Minneapolis delegation to support things, and that having um, you know lobbyists for legislators way outside the city who don't have anything uh, any any direct connection to us was just not a good use of funds. Uh, so that is why um, I am putting forward uh, this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, 
thank you to your point. I'm trying to find a better spot with better internet here. Um, the uh, I did have one other just procedural question, um, and again, I, I'm supportive of the effort here. Um, I, I have I, I have an amendment that I will be bringing forward uh, to the uh, Minneapolis Park Board's financial policies. Um, at, on the 15th that I think will address um, uh, the ongoing, the ongoing, like removing it as a political football, as Commissioner Meyer says, and I think that that's a smart thing to do. Uh, in part, the proposed changes to the um, financial policies, I, I plan on asking for support to add a section that that's commissioner salaries beginning in 2022. Um, I have $18,000 per year for commissioners and $24,000 for the president. I'm happy to talk about those. Uh, and then a policy would be beginning in 2020, in the 2023 superintendent's recommended budget, the superintendent shall include in their recommended budget a salary adjustment to commissioner compensation equal to the smallest negotiated annual adjustment for any uh, active collective bargaining agreement. Uh, this provision does not supersede, replace, or repeal any authority provided to the Board of Commissioners under city charter because we do have the obligation, or we do have the authority to vote to change that any time. Uh, th this would work very similar to, this has come up with uh, developed, non-developed parks in the past. The, so staff have direction that they have to prepare a budget in a certain way. They bring that forward, the board modifies it. I think it takes the political football away if we set a number and then in the budget every year the superintendent has to factor that in um i like the lowest amount versus an average um i i like the numbers 22 to 26 uh 24 or i'm sorry 18 to 24 with the difference between commissioners and the president there is a very uh, i mean, there's two presidents that are sitting on this board i think any you uh member will tell you that the workload of the president is more than a 10% differential between that and other board members. And whoever is the president next year, your professional career will suffer and you will make professional sacrifices to do the job up to the level that it needs to be done. Um, so like a 10% differential, I, I don't think it's close to, um, it gets close to recognizing that. Um, the, the, the sources, um, I think that there are better sources. I, I won't be presenting, I won't be supporting this amendment. Um, I will be presenting a similar amendment with different funding sources that I hope everybody could get behind. It doesn't make a political target of any individual human beings. It deals with um, unspent funds. Uh, and then the point of procedural question that I have, um, we have a resolution coming up after this uh, in the when the legislative uh, when when the legislative committee sends a recommendation on um, lobbyist contracts to execute a contract with the individual that Commissioner Meyer is it, it for twenty twenty two that Commissioner Meyer is recommending removing the funding for tonight. So how do if I read that, if I read that resolution from the legislative committee that was an approval to enter in a co into a contract with that individual, that is direction to the superintendent to cut a check and write a contract. The so the superintendent then does have general fund balance to execute that direction of the board, even if it's not identified in the budget. So then, in effect, Commissioner Meyer's amendment may create an unbalanced budget um the and we're starting we're starting off thirty thousand dollars in the hole because the superintendent the president and the secretary will have to execute that resolution if it's passed at the full board so it, it's i'd prefer to see i'd prefer to see this piece of good governance paid for in a good governance sort, sort of way and this just doesn't quite line up so i, so I won't be supporting this but i think we can probably and can you yeah, show that a, a procedural question you were asking? Or? Yeah, so the procedural question is what happens, Superintendent or Council Rice, 
if there are two concurrent conflicting resolutions. One says there's no money to do it. One says go do it. I think we only have one resolution here, or one amendment. There is a resolution from the legislative and intergovernment oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. To, to execute a contract. We're the, putting that forward to, to ask. Um, yeah, so how do we do both? How do we cut the funding for it? All right. Would yeah. you like to address that, please? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bourne, um, well, you try to avoid a train wreck. I mean, at this point, it's a hypothetical question. You'd have to determine whether or not the board uh, is going to vote for both of them at the same time or vote them both down or vote up one and not the other. You should. It, you obviously need uh, Ms. Wiseman, I, I'm sure, is somewhere in sight or sound. Um, the board should uh, balance its budget as you prepare a resolution. And I think uh, if the funds aren't available, then you should not vote for one or the other. You should identify the source of the funding. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Bourne, did you have anything more to say? I mean, you have extended your time. Uh, so. No, not anything else to the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Musich, please. Thank you, Chair Forney. Um, Commissioner Bourne asked a couple of the questions I was going to ask, but uh, I, I doubt that staff recommended that we cut the contract that the board approved as part of the funding mechanism for this. So I'm wondering if the provision for wage insurance and pension adjustments, um, if there's available funding in that bucket for the full amount of the increase being proposed for commissioner salaries. Is Director Weissman available to address that? Forney and Commissioner Musick, um, the provision for wage adjustment um, would have the ability to cover the full amount of the adjustment. Okay, so if, if we were to propose an amendment, the amendment, um, we could get to a place where the full amount is coming out of the provision for insurance wage insurance and pension adjustment. Great, thank you. Um, the second, what did you have something else to say? Um, Sarah Forney and Commissioner Musich, uh, the only other thing that I would say is that um, we do not have a legal obligation or a legal contract until the contract is, is executed and signed by all parties. So if there ended up being a disconnect between uh, board action, say the budget approval and a previous board action, we would have the ability to come back and amend uh, whatever, whichever one was out of alignment. Okay, thank you for that additional clarifying information. I'd rather get us to a place where we're balanced when we vote on this rather than coming back and trying to fix a hole later. Um, Mr. Bourne indicated that he'd be bringing forward an amendment at the next meeting that would tie the commissioner's salary increase to the lowest bargaining unit number. Um, I'm interested in understanding what the legal ramifications might be for the park board to tie elected officials' compensation to um, to, to our union contract compensation. Are we allowed to do that or is that considered to be an unfair business practice? Council Rice, do you have, um, can you address that for us? Um, yes, uh, uh, Chair uh, Forney, um, Commissioner Musich, it's not uncommon to see a provision like that tied to some index and I believe the City Council may have a uh, similar provision where it's tied to uh, Whatever the prevailing collective bargaining rate with their employees are, so I don't. It's not illegal under the state law that allows the commissioners to set their salary. Unlike the city council, you can set it at any time, and I think you can set it by any objective measure you'd like to. Okay, and, and the current item that we have before us for debate is tied to an average across all increases in the organization. Is, is that accurate? 
Okay. Dr. Wiseman gives me a thumbs up. Um, I've got that piece correct. Um, so uh, I know my time is up. I just want to briefly say that I I'm really not interested in um, pursuing a cutting of our lobbyist contract to achieve uh, a salary increase for commissioners. I, I do appreciate that my colleagues are interested in increasing compensation. I know the pay is something that many people brought up to me uh, when I was trying to talk them into running for park board this last cycle. So um, I'm hopeful that a increase in, in salary will broaden the, um, the pool of candidates for our next election in four years. Um, and that more people will be able to accommodate public service in their lives um, because we're, we're paying something a bit more reasonable to people for the time commitment. So um, that was really all I had to say. I, I don't think that I can support the amendment as written. I could support um, a revised amendment that, that struck the lobbyist contract and instead took the funds from where the rest of the time from. Thank you, Commissioner Musage. Uh, Commissioner Meyer for a second time. Thank you. Just responding to procedural questions. Uh, first, you know, the, the final budget will be on December 8th. Uh, the lobbyist contracts won't be considered until December 15th. Um, I requested that President Kogel put them in that order precisely so that we could settle the budget question and then whichever way the budget question goes, then that would be direction uh, for the contracts a week later. Um, as to any amendments to the amendment, you know, that would require a suspension of the rules uh, to consider that. I, I would say it probably would be better uh, to propose whatever different amendments commissioners have in mind for the December 8th meeting. Commissioner Poirier for a second time. Uh, thank you, Chair Porney. It, it's uh, some levels, you know, these are actually what were originally two pretty bad ideas. <laughs> um, but I think that there's good governance behind one of them. Um, I don't need to be trademarked on that quote, though. But the, um, you know, I think if we take, um, let's not make this a political football any more than it needs to be. The we I, I'd encourage Commissioner Meyer to just withdraw his amendment. Well, one of the things that we can look at, like I'm curious to hear perspectives on the differences in the salary number. But like I say, I think the um, eighteen thousand and twenty four thousand is a pretty good split. We did. I, I will remind us that we're a data driven board, and we did go out and have a independent commission look at this a few years ago and they came back with the information that when you look at everything, we're actually kind of in line. And the if we're not going to use that data, that's fine. Uh, like Because I do think that this board is overworked. I, I think 18 and 24 is personally a better number. Um, the, the Commissioner Musich's point, it, it's not setting a policy on, on what it, it... It's not setting setting a policy on what a recommendation in the budget will be. So the board still has to approve it each year. So if they don't like what it is because it's tied to a collective bargaining agreement, they can then change that. Um, I would be interested in move when, when I bring something forward, if there's a reservation with tying it to a collective bargaining unit, I don't like tying it to the average. I, I think if there's anybody in the, in, in the organization that is not taking a pay raise for one year, then the board should not take a pay raise that year. So, I, so I'd like to tie it to the lowest, um, to the lowest pay raise that's happening in a year, not not an average. So I, I chose collective bargaining agree, uh, agreements, but like I'd like to hear other people's thoughts. I'm happy to write this coming forward. Um, I I don't want to see the board taking a raise and putting themselves in a position of taking a raise when other people aren't. So um, I don't like it. Um, but I, I'd encourage the Commissioner Meyer to withdraw this amendment. I, it, it's really sounding to me like we can get something that we're all going to get behind and all feel pretty good about. Commissioner um, Usage, for a second time. Do you like to make a motion to suspend the rules, the purpose of amending the amendment, if that's allowable under Robert's rules of order? Great. Um, 
On that, will the secretary please call a roll on suspending the rule? Commissioner, <clears throat> excuse me, Commissioner Bourne. No. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. No. Commissioner Hassan. Excuse me. Um, Vice Chair Hassan. Commissioner French. No. Vice President Vita. Uh, can you do it one more time? Recorded as an aye. Thank you. President Cogill. No. Chair Forney. Aye. You have three ayes, four nays, two absent. Thank you, that fails. Um, so uh, we are back to the um, amendment. And uh, unless there's further discussion here, and I've seen any, uh, with the secretary, um, or unless uh, Commissioner Meyer wants to um, rescind it. Anyway, um, will the there secretary please? There, there, there is a hand up. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I, I don't know who is talking. I don't see any hands up. So, would the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Bourne. No. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Did you remember? No. Vice President Vita. President Cogill. Aye. And let me note, um, Vice President Vita is recorded as a as a no. Chair Hassan. Vice Chair Son, I apologize. And then um, Chair Forney. I, excuse me, no, I, I apologize. <laughs> okay. That's a no. I believe I have two ayes, five nays, and two absent. Thank you. So on the resolution, um, don't, okay, I saw a hand kind of going up in the air. <laughs> yes, President Cogill. Uh, well, I'll wait until after you've declared, but I'm putting my hand up because I can't raise my hand here, I guess, uh, myself. I could put a thumbs up, but I, I was That's hoping okay. to move. It, it has been moved. I was hoping to move some additional uh, amendments to the budget. Oh, okay. Um, Where well, I was raising my hand. Okay. Go ahead and, and present them. <laughs> okay, very good. There are three um, amendments to the budget uh, that I that I have that were provided in uh, notice ahead of the meeting. Um, I, I think that I will um, I will move them as a slate, and certainly people can break them up. I'm sure there will be desire to do so. Um, the the first is. Uh, a, mo a motion to amend the busker fee that is being introduced by staff from $50 to $5 annually. Uh, the purpose being we haven't had a busker fee before. I have not particularly, um, well, I'll, I guess I'll speak to it later, sorry. Uh, and then moving the uh, an amendment of the parking fee schedule and then finally adding uh, just three words to the central gym CIP description. Uh, to include a skate park. We have information. Is, is that a slate that you're proposing? I am proposing them as one slate, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, any discussion to that? Um, I, I believe that, um, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. And maybe I'll oh, yeah. speak, speak to them now. Uh, so the Muscovy was introduced by staff um, 
uh, frankly, I don't think we have enough understanding of what the uh, racial equity impact is going to be here. If you read the racial equity impact, it's uh, pretty thin on data. And um, if we're going to do this, uh, you know, dealing with folks who are out in the system trying to make a few dollars, I, I'm certain that busking is not a particularly fruitful enterprise. Um, it also provides a, a great kind of uh, flavor and um, dynamic aspect to our public spaces. Um, and I would uh, be very concerned if we uh, did something that ended up being a um, detriment to um, having uh, music in, in the parks by, by just random folks. Um, we're not New Orleans. We're not a destination for this. Uh, and I wouldn't want to put a damper on it. So I am, I think, providing a, a recommendation or a, a, an amendment here that's pretty reasonable. It allows staff to do so um, because they believe that this is a, a way to actually um, get buskers into specific sites and make some heavily trafficked sites more dynamic. Um, but it uh, provides a much more reasonable runway uh, for folks that maybe don't have a lot um, to put towards something like a permit fee um, and are just trying to make a few extra dollars. Um, the parking fee schedule amendment is uh, an acknowledgement that climate change is real and that we cannot continue to be uh, providing um, free parking on the backs of taxpayers and on the backs of our children. Um, uh, and the future of our uh, our city, and if this the park board and the city are, are real about addressing climate change and aren't climate deniers, we should uh, internalize the external costs of free parking. Um, so essentially, what the fee schedule does is uh, increase um, parking uh, across the parking fees uh, across the system. The lowest uh, hourly fee uh, being shifted to a uh, dollar fifty. Um, in addition, finally, the central gym CIP piece is really just about adding that skate park piece in um, as a, an additional consideration uh, for um, CIP dollars uh, allocated to central gym. Um, there's been some discussion about how Hennepin County sports grants were supposed to be used there. Uh, it looks like maybe they can't be, but there was a, a commitment there, and there's certainly a, a desire still to see a skate park there. We've made some really great strides, um, and I wouldn't want to lose um, the, um, the uh, initial interest and investment um, and, and kind of sense of progress towards that um, without, without uh, having skate park in, involved there. So with that, I will uh, yield the floor. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Uh, I, I support all three amendments. Um, to the Busker one, um, you know, I, I saw that in the proposed budget. I actually had to look up what a, a Busker was. That's not the word that I would, would use for it. But um, uh, I, I am skeptical about having that fee at all. But if we have to have one, I would certainly want to see it as low as possible. So I think that goes in the right direction. Um, support the parking fee increase and uh, support the skate park at Central Park. Thank you. Hey, Commissioner Bourne, is what I'm seeing. Yep. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Um, the, the skate park I'm on board with. Um, the the busker fee. I, I have some overall concerns just with the. I, I don't want to create a policy or procedure from somebody that might be destitute and might literally be out. It, it might be the difference of like, hey, I might be on a corner with a sign asking for money to, like, for anything, versus somebody that that is incredibly destitute versus. Uh, somebody that is incredibly destitute that has a guitar. And the, I, I don't want to create an inadvertent situation where we're creating like a license to ask for money or a license to, I, I don't like using the word panhandle, but the, there, there's some, 
there's some really kind of ugly ordinances against panhandling and and proceduralizing that and and punishing and and creating creating permits for people to be poor. So so I'm I'm really concerned about the unintended consequences of this. Like if somebody just takes a guitar out to the parkway, I, I don't want them to be stopped, and I don't want somebody to say, "Hey, where's your where's your permit for doing this? Where's your where's your fee?" Hey, you're under arrest for because you're you're giving this cop a hard time, and something could like very quickly kind of escalate. Um, so I want to be careful. I, I want to be careful around that. So so I, I don't. I'd be more in favor of just eliminating it. So so I don't think I I would support that, but I would support an amendment next week to just eliminate it in total. Um, the the parking fees I, I don't want to have unintended consequences for people again that are trying to access parks with maybe the it, it there might be a scenario where you've got a minivan full of small kids and that is your most affordable way to get to the park because a bus fare or light rail fare may um, may be more so than um, than just driving your minivan there if, that, if that's what you have so. I could be convinced on that one, um, but I, I won't be. I, I won't be supporting it tonight. I, I would also want to make sure that the revenue was. I, I want to make sure that the the revenue offsets some reductions in, in youth fees. Um, so uh, I, I'd like I'd like to divide the question in, into three. Prepared to vote yes for the um, for the CIP tonight. I, I won't be supporting the other two. I could probably, I think we're all close to the same page on the other two, though, and I, I would support something. I, I would support something on the eighth, and I'd be happy to work with President Kogan offline on that. Commissioner French. Yeah, I would I would support uh, splitting the question. Uh, I'm having a hard, hard time uh, with the busker, uh, the busker, uh, how do we determine who's a busker? How do we, if some kids are out, you know, I've, I've gone out to Lake Bede Makaska and I just, I caught a couple of kids just rapping and one, you know, beating on the, uh, the table and got somebody start throwing them a dollar or two, whatever. Will they be charged? Well, who, who will come in and enforce that? I'm, 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 I'm having a, having a, a hard time. Uh, we're not in New York. We're not in New York. Like, like we said, we're not, we're not a, we are a tourist attraction, but I, I don't think we're known for our music. Uh, and I, I think we're, we're setting ourselves up to create an incident that we don't need to create. I think we're going to wind up having a situation with some type of enforcement, uh, a leg of enforcement from the park board, whether it be the police or the park patrol. And we're going to, they're going to be talking to some young, young, young person who's out, you know, maybe trying to make a couple of dollars and doesn't know about a, a busking fee, doesn't know about a license or whatever. And I think we're, we're adding a, um, a layer of, of regulation that doesn't need to be there. So I want I want to make sure that we're having a separate discussion about the bus fee uh, with the other ones. So I want I would I would support the buying the question. Thank you, uh, Commissioner President uh, Cogill, and, and Commissioner uh, Meyer. Are you, is your hand up for a second time? Okay, so uh, go ahead, uh, President Cogill. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Forney or Chair Forney. Uh, I would ask then, I, I, I agree in a lot of ways with Commissioner French, uh, Commissioner Bourne on the busker fee. Uh, I did get an explanation uh, from staff that I think is a little bit instructive, and I, I wonder if either um, Director Stenzel or the Deputy Superintendent could give us a little bit of background on the purpose of the uh, introduction of that fee as a concept. Um, I think it might be helpful right now as we're discussing this. Um, Are either good available? I am. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair Forney, Commissioner Kogel. Um, I'm not Shane Sunzo, but I am Annie Olson, um, and Shane and I uh, work together, and I wanted to give a little bit of framing on the intention uh, of um, proposing this fee in this program. Um, with the expansion of the the park system and the downtown spaces, um, lots of new um, exciting opportunities um, are in front of us. And Jane and I have done research um, on other cities um, with urban parks 
that are kind of in the downtown core and found kind of an interesting idea in a busker program that would be very intentional to activate spaces in uh, particular zones uh, of, of parks. And we wanted to pilot it. Um, we were looking at some opportunities, you know, with our new market uh, square, market plaza that's coming on, um, some of the downtown spaces, um, potentially commons, others. Um, we had thought, you know, let's look at how other cities are doing this. We found numerous examples for our benchmarking. Um, and we're really excited about an opportunity to bring some vibrancy intentionally to particular spaces, um, you know, potentially leaning upon um, some programmatic pieces that already exist within my department um, with community events and all of the uh, music apps that come in through that process for our music and movies program, uh, potentially providing additional opportunities for um, some of those um, one-person um, apps to maybe um, help to activate some of those spaces in a different way. Uh, currently, the way that, that things work is that um, this busking isn't actually allowed within our park system, um, and we wanted to create an avenue um, that allowed so intentionally in specific locations for a small fee that would also um, provide some activation um, and some creativity in certain spaces. So just a little bit of framing on the intentionality of this. Um, uh, we, we wanted to try something new. So uh, I'm happy to take other questions. I hope that clears it up a little bit. Um, so please let me know. That, that's helpful. And, and, and the, the thing that I would say uh, to, to that, I just, um, you know, I, I brought this amendment forward to kind of go along with the logic of staff. But I would say, you know, um, if you look at the downtown council, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they paid their buskers uh, to be on site along Nicollet Avenue and provided a small pay, uh, stipend of some sort. And it would seem to me if the goal is to expand busking in the system at certain sites, wouldn't we want to offer an incentive as opposed to a permit fee? That, that's my thought. I know this is going slightly against what I, <laughs> what I put forward as, a, uh, as an amendment, but um, Overall, the concern is if we're really trying to activate, it should be as close to free as possible if we need to have some control over the site thing, or, or it should be actually a payment. Any any more comments? Or? Um, I don't have a specific comment to, to Commissioner Colville's comment. Um, I just said uh, we modeled our proposal after research that we did and benchmarking from other cities. Thank you. Very great. Okay, I believe that we have Commissioner Meyer who uh, wishes to speak. For the second time to the divided part anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I'm still willing to support this amendment because I feel it would go in the right direction, but I'm also willing to support um, an alternative amendment would be willing to support suspending the rules tonight if, if other commissioners are inclined to, to just not have the bus fee at all, and uh, to subsequently um, you know, change the policy to allow for busking. Because I feel um, you know, street performers, like especially on like the Stone Arch Bridge, really add to the street life and are a positive thing. And at a minimum, you know, I, I wouldn't want to discourage that. Thank you. Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, Chair Barney. It, it really is good work on behalf of um, uh, Director Olson and M Mr. Stenzel, but I, I do, I, I keyed in on something that, that Annie said, and I'm embarrassed to say this, after 12 years I didn't know that busking was not allowed in the parks, that somebody could be, could be stopped, and so I, I think it is more of a policy question and not a budget question this year. So yes, I would appreciate a zero fee, but I don't think we're getting to, I don't know if a suspension of the rules tonight, I don't want to write a policy tonight on on Zoom. Like, I, I'd like to see a policy come back on the, on the 15th that removes that prohibition from busking in the parks. Um, if the, and then, yeah, if, if I, I agree with Commissioner 
Saratoga, if we need to find a few dollars in the budget to find some targeted areas where we want to bring people in. I, I don't think we prohibit it anywhere, but if there's a few spots that we really want to activate that space that is in line with the work that Director Olson and Mr. Sensel did, we find a, a, a few thousand dollars to do it. I, I've got to imagine a five dollar fee or even the fee that is a initially um, proposed in the totality of the budget we're talking about tonight, we're spending a lot of time talking about it. So for the amount of revenue it's going to generate, I'd rather just pass a policy on, on the 15th that that removes that prohibition. So so I wouldn't support a suspension of the rules to move a fee, move a fee to zero, which will still create that permitting process and that um, may create a barrier for some people. So I, so I wouldn't support that tonight, but let's get this done. Uh, between a budget between a budget amendment if necessary on the eighth and for sure a policy revision on, on the fifteenth. Commissioner French, did you need to speak or you just need to take your hand down? Commissioner French? Oh I, I I'm like I I said before, I'm I'm more concerned about the uh about about how there was, a, there was an incident a couple of years ago. I, it probably was before I was a commissioner about a young man that was doing some stuff on the Stone Arch Bridge. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Secretary Ringo, were you trying to? I do not mean to oh. interrupt. I just want to be in queue. I don't have a way to raise my hand otherwise. We see you, you uh, uh, Secretary Ringo, and uh, oh. Commissioner, continue. So my, my, my concern is the the the, the enforcement and, and the, would would it be? Right, I, I went to South High School. I went to South High School. I worked at South High School, and there was a couple of kids who were in the program that I worked in. And the first time I ever heard the word busking was when the kid told me he he was going to go do some busking downtown. And I said, "What busking? What is? Oh, we're going to go play for some music." And this kid didn't have his family didn't have a lot of money. His 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 two moms were. You know they were they were going through some stuff and and this kid his way to make a couple of dollars or buy a pop or buy some stuff at school was, was to go out and and play his trumpet and so I'm 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 really worried about we're adding barriers uh, and 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 that and that creating pathways and how do we so how do we add, create pathways I love the idea of actually paying some artists to come and, and perform in certain places it, it's I think we need to talk about how we get more art in our parks and that. And that restricting art. Oh, that's just, I'm sorry, I'm blabbering. Secretary Ringel. Thank you, uh, Chair Forney. Um, so this is this has evolved into a conversation that I don't think we expected. <laughs> um, and but it's it's a valuable conversation and might cause us to take some thinking back to it. So it, to understand the reason why we would be proposing a fee is we're trying to be compliant with ordinance PB2-15. So that ordinance, it's not actually a policy, it sits at ordinance level where um, that ordinance prevents financial gain of individuals within the park system. Excuse me. So it is what actually spurs us to think about much of the way we interact with folks who are generating revenue within the system now. I don't want to create a view that we're out looking for buskers and trying to ticket buskers for not being in compliance with that ordinance by any means, but this was a way for us to introduce a program that would be consistent with our existing ordinances. Um, so it, I just wanted to provide that context. So, like, so I, I get that. I, is there a way that we could add something, and this is maybe talk a little bit more about it, but like to limit like, like you can't open, you can't put out a sound system and the amplifier and stuff like that. So, like, I'm, I'm okay with you know putting some type of you know limitations like that as far as amplified sound or, or if there's some type of big production or whatever. Uh, I, I think one one or two people sitting on a park bench playing a trumpet or you know beating on a drum or something. We need to figure out a way to, to promote that Thank and you. discourage the, the the more elaborate productions. Can I share message. Thank you for recognizing me to speak, uh, Chair Foyne, I appreciate it. Um, what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that, that there's a problem with an 
ordinance. So perhaps a more appropriate way to address that concern would be to amend the budget to add a goal for the customer service division for 2022 to work with legal to assess necessary changes to that ordinance to allow for busking in the park system. Um, and I'd be happy to work with staff on writing that goal or if um, President Cogill wanted to do so. I mean, I think that might be a more appropriate way than I mean, every other change we've made to our ordinances we've been very deliberate about. We've, we've taken the time to really understand it. We've gone through the exercise of engaging community around what we're proposing to do, and we give them an opportunity to weigh in. Um, it's the end of the year. <laughs> I, I, and what we're proposing is a change to the ordinances that dictate the rules in our park. So it, I would not be really excited to see something come forward to change an ordinance in the next two weeks, um, but I, I would be able to support a goal in the budget that requests that work be done and that staff bring something forward for consideration by the next board and the public. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Bourne, I think you have spoken twice on to these amendments and everything. Yeah. So, or, um, point I, of inquiry, uh, Commissioner or Chair Forney. Okay. Your visual, please. Uh, th thank you. It is the um, uh, deputy superintendent? It, it is the ordinance that you just referenced. The only prohibition of busking in the parks, because I, I, I'm not, I can't. I would be hard pressed to find any busker if asked to provide a spreadsheet of profit and loss that they make a financial gain in the parks through busking. If you look at the time that they've taken to learn an instrument, learn a trade, buy an instrument, spend their time that they could all otherwise be out of the job, I would imagine that they are losing money by busking and not gaining. So I'm wondering if the ordinance even applies. And it, it just seems a lot of process for something that may not even an issue in terms of adding a goal. So, so is that the only prohibition, uh, Deputy Superintendent? Chair Forney, um, Commissioner Bourne, I think we would need to look into it a little bit further, to be honest. I, this, was, this was an unintended outcome of the conversation. It's given us a lot of good things to think about. Um, we were simply using similar processes that we've had for other fees in the past. And so you're, you are asking very good questions, but I'm not prepared to be able to answer all of them at this time. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on then to um, President Hoville, who might want to speak to his amendment. Yeah, uh, it sounds like there's interest in making something else happen, so I will withdraw this amendment um, at this time. Uh, I'll either support in the future removing it entirely or coming up with something that truly incentivizes artists to be part of the system. Are you, are you, are you withdrawing your entire amendment? I or just you the, the, Sorry, it was, I, I believe we had I had requested splitting the amendments so I'm a, and I'm withdrawing the um, busker fee piece. I would continue to consider both the other two pieces. Okay, so we are considering then only the two items uh, regarding parking fees and the CIP for um, the central trim, am I correct? And we'll be voting on those two. We are deleting then the um, busker fee, okay. So I don't see any more um, uh, hands risen, so I will um, ask the secretary to please call a roll on those sold uh, two amendments. Uh, I'm so, that's not how dividing the question works. Are you, are you taking them one at a time? We'll start with those requested. Is that what you would like to do, uh, President Yeah, okay. yeah that's what All dividing right. the question. And we, will, we will do then um, the parking fee one first. The secretary please call a roll on that item. Commissioner Bourne. No tonight. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Meyer. 
Aye. Commissioner French. No. Vice President Vita. No. Recorded as a no. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. Aye. You have three ayes, four nays, two absent. Thank you. So moving on then to the next amendment, which has to do with the CIP, okay, uh, regarding uh, central gym. I'm articulating that properly. Anyway, I would actually please call the rule. Com Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Severson. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice President Vita. Recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. Aye. You have seven ayes, two absent. Passes. So we are back to the main motion of um, the budget. Um, is there any more uh, conversation about that? Um, I don't see any hands on that. Um, I will, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Forney. I'm sorry it's, uh, so it appears to be such a chore. Um, the, I think a lot of good work has gone into this budget. Um, there, there's a, a lot of it that I support. Uh, I, I just wanted to make commissioners aware that there is a series of amendments that I'm considering and working offline with a couple of other commissioners that wouldn't break, uh, that wouldn't break quorum to bring forward on the, um, on the 8th and then some subsequent uh, reflections, and I kind of hinted at it already, some reflections in changes of policy on the 15th to uh, bring them over. Um, I mentioned the commissioner salary uh, adjustment and alignment, and I, I hope I could have support from commissioners through that. Um, I, I think I gave the gist of what that would be. Um, I plan on making it balanced through um, some of Commissioner Meyer's uh, identified sources. Um, I think we have had some brilliant models and pilots this year and some data to back up some work that we've done around the reduction in youth fees and increasing access for folks that may otherwise not have access. We eliminated some water recreation fees and the we got a lot of positive response for that and the public good certainly outweighed any financial costs that we may have incurred. Uh, so, so I've gone through and I've looked at a list of, um, I think I've identified all of the youth fees in the fee schedule. Uh, I'm looking at um, substituting a fee with a suggested contribution policy. So um, that would be a modification to our uh, Minneapolis Park Board financial policies to where instead of charging a, a fee, the staff would inform a park user what the total cost is to provide that service and then invite them to make a contribution to the greatest amount they're able. Uh, I, think a combination be, I think a combination between increased donations from folks that can't afford to give more and can see the value in that. Um, and an increase in some of our grant and fund uh, fundraising efforts that we've all also been successful with since funding it last year would balance most, if not all of these, uh, all of these proposed fee reductions. Um, it, it's hard to delineate in our in our fee section um, in in recreation and in enterprise how much of those fees come from youth services, and how much come from, um, and how much come from fees that um, people under 18 are not the intended beneficiary of. Uh, so I am going to need a little bit of work with 
uh, Director Wiseman offline to just identify the projected revenue sub uh, revenue amounts so we can substitute those. Um, so I just want to make the uh, the board aware that I will be uh, working with some commissioners to bring forward some amendments to substitute youth fees with um, suggested contributions from park users, and I think that would go a long way towards uh, eliminating eliminating some barriers to access. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, I will be bringing forth an amendment um, at the uh, eighth board meeting, and it will be um, publicized. Um, I believe, I, Julie, um, or Director Wiseman, if you could remind us all when those amendments are due, um, I'd appreciate it. Um, can you do a reminder on that? Oh, okay, Superintendent uh, Van Gora, do you have a... The sure, sorry. Oh, yeah, it's just funny. I'm sorry, there was a question that was asked. I probably jumped in too quickly before uh, Director Weissman answered the question for you. So was there a question that you asked Director Weissman before I... I'm sorry if I interrupted. Uh, we would just like to know when, when the amendments are due so that they can be uh, transparent and we can... Uh, all people are aware ahead of time. Absolutely. Director Weissman, did you want to answer that and then I can follow? Well, yes, I'm Board of Secretary Ringel, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the budget adoption will occur on December Wednesday, December 8th, so you would have until noon on December 7th to submit your amendment. I appreciate that. So, um, Just a point uh, of information, Chair Farming. But... They have a point yeah. of information on the data. Yeah. Okay. Am I recognized for that? But it, yes, am I recognized? Are. Okay. It, 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 so the the date that Director Wiseman gave is the date for inclusion of amendments on inclusion inclusion of amendments on the agenda without requiring a two thirds majority. But amendments are in order presented up until we take the vote we just the threshold raises to two, two thirds my my understanding that process correctly anybody want to address that yes your understanding is correctly okay i just want to make sure the i, I don't want anybody to get accused of being non-transparent if they're just following the board so and that's you know, I, I think that the rule of the amendments were put in for a reason of transparency and so I'd appreciate if we could uh, I could say I will be putting forth an amendment regarding um, a commissioner compensation um, uh, similar to what um, Commissioner Meyer um, did but utilizing different sources that I will in consultation with um, Director Wiseman and the superintendent what is the appropriate fund to be tapping so um, on that um, it looks like uh, Superintendent Bangor wishes to speak Oh, you don't. You're okay. <laughs> okay. So on the resolution, oh, five. <laughs> a real hand is up, and that's uh, Secretary Ringel. Thank you, Chair Forney. Julie's absolutely right. No question. What I will say is, if you want the most opportunity for the public and others to see an amendment that you want to put forward, get it to us before this Friday, and it will be posted as part of the agenda when the agenda gets posted on Friday evening. So if you want the most exposure for your recommended um, amendment, that would be the opportunity. Thank you for that reminder and excellent uh, point. Uh, the public is, has every right to know. So with that, will the secretary please call the roll on resolution 2021-367. Commissioner Bourne. I will abstain. Commissioner Musich. Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer. Meyer. Commissioner French. Commissioner French. Vice President Vita. Yes. Oh, pardon me, Commissioner French? I was wondering if you recorded my vote. 
I, I did not hear it. All right. Thank you. Vice President Vita, recorded as an aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. Aye. You have six ayes, one abstain, and two absent. That passes. I thank you all. And with that, I will declare the um, Admin Finance uh, Committee adjourned here at 9 o'clock. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good night. Take care, everyone. Get a voice. <laughs> Goodbye.